And then um, the action item that we have tonight is the 2022 Butte Hill Native Plant um, and Tree Proposals. So we've got Robert and Crystal here for Montana Tech, and we've got Abby and Brandon from Butte Silver Bow, and they'll they'll present their plans. And um, that is that is an action item. Build me action item for tonight. But yeah, it's something to check that at the end. Sure. Um, it would be our participation, I guess, my participation in the um, climate adaptation workshop that was in town and be able to just chit chat a little bit about that with yep. regards to how we can support that effort. That okay. sounds great. Yeah. All right. And with that, uh, Amy, we'll, we'll go to you and. Um, folks, this meeting is going to be recorded, just helps me get the notes together a lot better so i'm a rookie at teams can you help me push your cord you know how to do that <laughs> i think it's it's recording it's already Aaron, already yeah, it's recording oh sweet okay <laughs> hey hot mic <laughs> thank you go ahead amy thank you okay i will get started Yeah. How's that? Can you all see that? Yep. Can everybody hear? A little more. A little more. All right. Okay. And hoping I know how to forward this actually to. There we go. Okay. We're good. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm presenting about the um, Butte Area 1 grant we got for Basin Creek, um, doing low-tech restoration up there for watershed resiliency, meaning water resiliency, um, and particularly um, as a, just an exercise in seeing if we can make things wetter under drying conditions. So the project objectives, this this grant has been kind of, uh, it's been in place and sometimes stagnating for quite some time due to multiple reasons. Um, anyway, we had we started way back in 2017 and the original timeline is 2017 to 2019. Um, the original objectives were to restore at least uh, two and a half miles of headwater stream corridor above Basin Creek Reservoir. Um, that was uh, optimistic, and we ended up with more like one mile above of restoration upstream of the um, reservoir. And then uh, the um, objective also was to restore 0.9 miles of ephemeral stream corridor in the upper Blacktail Creek watershed. Uh, we tackled some new stretches of stream, mostly it involved expanding and upgrading projects that had gone in under other funding. So this grant, the Butte Area 1, helped us match a climate adaptation grant. Um, and so the two grants worked together and we had already started some of the work with the climate adaptation grant uh, to get some of those projects in. Uh, we're to work closely with restoration partners in the entire watershed to maximize habitat connectivity. Uh, and stream resiliency. Uh, so a lot of our um, effort, we um, we were in close contact with Forest Service. Uh, this kind of dovetailed with some upland thinning that they were doing already. Uh, and we uh, cooperated a lot with Montana Tech and CFWEP. Um, then otherwise it was more informal and that ties to the item four also. Um, looking, coordinating with other monitoring efforts in Southwest Montana, uh, we were in touch with um, Pedro Marquez uh, from Big Hole and people working in that watershed. So Andy Bopes um, talked a lot with Andy to inform our, um, whoa, did I lose you? I'm not sure what happened there, but let me get back to my presentation. There, sorry, I hope that, <laughs> is back. It's back. You're good. 
OK, good. Uh, and so anyway, we um, coordinated with Andy Bulps, who is with um, Bureau of Mines and Montana Tech, and he was doing a lot of the restoration uh, monitoring for for a similar project in um, projects in the big hole. And so we got his input on setting up the monitoring network in the um, upper basin. And then um, the other part was conducting outreach efforts for multiple audiences, and that was done partly through CFWEP. Um, we worked, um, all of this is, um, when I say we, sorry, I skipped over part of the, the, front, the front page. Um, this is a contract that Watershed Restoration Coalition managed. And uh, so through Watershed Restoration Coalition, um, they were able to get a lot of different partnerships. Um, we had multiple agencies up for a watershed tour. Uh, we worked with Montana Tech, uh, gave presentation to DNRC's, um, the, the governor's um, drought committee. Uh, so anyway, there have been multiple different outreach efforts. So funding was, uh, the, the grant was $40,000, and as I said, it was matched by the Wildlife Conservation Society um, Climate Adaptation Grant. Um, and uh, there were multiple contracting changes, you know, pandemic, um, just other delays with staffing changes, uh, things like that. So we ended up kind of extending the contract, extending the contract. It just kind of stayed stagnant for a couple of years, and then we picked it back up to finish it out. So um, the, the task kind of changed. Uh, we did do some modifications to uh, change some fund allocations so we could support Montana Tech's uh, monitoring more and uh, basically helped fund a master's thesis or master's project through Montana Tech and buy some of the monitoring equipment, water monitoring equipment that they would use in that study. Um, and we decided that continuing with the monitoring of these um, and supporting that was really, um, it was going to be kind of more able to finish out the project than, than starting new sites that would not then be able to be maintained given all the, the time work, uh, framework. A little bit about why we started um, looking at this. Um, I had already started with some of the restoration and then um, basically while I was living in Malta and dealing with the winters there and thinking about the sites over in Butte, uh, I did an exercise looking at the old 19, late 1990s aerials in Google Earth and comparing them to the most recent at that time aerials um, in ArcGIS and also what they had in, in Google Earth and compared um, beaver ponds, um, this, how many beaver ponds I found in the old black and whites to the current aerials because I had noticed um, basically that there were recently dried ponds everywhere and I saw some of the older images and realized that those ponds were no longer in place. And so this is just a, a mapping exercise. Um, and I don't know if there we go to move this in case that matters for you guys. Um, so I coded these ponds that I saw and if there was a uh, the pond was no longer there, then it got uh, a red dot and then a decrease is an orange dot. Anyway, so as you can see, the trend is not good as far as the amount of active beaver ponding and you expect beavers to kind of cycle through and move on, um, abandon some ponds and start others. But the problem is we have very, very few new ponds or an increase in size, meaning they're maintaining them or even the same, um, maintaining them at a same level which some of those are just maintained by springs. Uh, so anyway, this kind of um, really kind of tied it to the climate change um, or at least drought management question and kind of uh, really started to inform this, this effort to want to see if we can do something to reverse this trend. Um, so there were some of our sites, we have sites over in, um, in the blacktail part, so this is I don't know if you guys can see my cursor or not. Anyway, so above the, the reservoirs, um, that Basin Creek, that's around the reservoirs there, that, that watershed, as you well know. And then Lion Kiln area is due east of that on the upper Blacktail. And so those are where our projects are. 
So go forward. There we go. Oh, so um, this is over on the black tail, and this is an example. These were ponded 20 years ago, and now um, there aren't any active ponds in this area, and the pines are moving in, the channel single thread, uh, the groundwater table has been dropping, um, creating basically converting wetland to upland. So the idea in all of these areas in Blacktail and um, in the new sites in Basin Creek under this grant were to reverse that trend and make things wetter instead of drier. So the project sites, um, the new construction is on Basin and we were able to tackle basin sites one through three. I actually did wetland delineation at all of these areas in green, um, anticipating we would get over to um, basin four. Uh, the, the sites BT010203, those are blacktail. Those are over in the lime kiln and um, the other branch of the, the headwaters of Blacktail Creek. And so those are sites we had started and then got maintained, um, partly maintained through this grant. So um, under this grant, we did the wetland delineation reporting at all of the sites in Basin, um, did new construction, as I said, on the three sites. We maintained the sites on Blacktail, um, only part of the sites on Blacktail. And then the net monitoring network was put in at all the sites that we had tackled, um, except Basin 3. Um, Basin 1 and 2 got the uh, monitoring network, and I'll talk a little bit about that coming in. And we had we set up more monitoring at the Blacktail sites so that the uh, researcher at Montana Tech could uh, do the hydrologic study. They also use the, the Blacktail sites for the hydro camp and just other student monitoring, training them up in um, hydrogeological um, techniques. So it's become kind of an outdoor lab for them, which is one of the best outcomes of this project, I believe. So these are the techniques we used. Um, this is one of the most common techniques, um, sometimes called a post-assisted beaver dam analog or just beaver dam analog or BDA. Uh, we did use posts in ours and so there weren't any willows left in these meadows, so uh, what we did was cut, uh, we thinned out some of the, the lodge pole that are around the meadows and then cut any of the encroaching pines on the wet meadow. We did leave the spruce because we figured, uh, you know, having some is there and they kind of belong there a little more when things are wetter. So the basic design is you have posts kind of keeping things in place, uh, the brush um, woven in among the posts. But in this, you'll see that they are not straight up and down. They kind of have a ramp um, on both sides of them. So they're a broad base triangle uh, pyramid <laughs> sort of. And so the idea is it's like a beaver dam um, where beavers will dig the pond in front of the dam and pile the mud up onto the dam. And so there's a pool and then it's the, the there's a ramp leading up to the top of the dam. And similarly, beavers put a lot of sticks on the downstream side of the dam. That's very important to have that um, stick skirt kind of down on the downstream end that really increases dam stability as we have found on multiple projects, especially in central Montana, where we've been doing this and um, in very, very erodible soil. So um, anyway, this is the basic idea and this is the primary technique we used. And the idea is to slow the water down and uh, allow deposition, which actually happens rather fast, uh, rather quickly in this area. Um, and then the um, the ground table, or the groundwater table rises and sub irrigates the entire floodplain, keeping the whole thing wetter. And over time, that positive feedback of things being wetter help things um, help water stay in the system longer and feed the stream is the theory. And as we'll see, did work um, according to monitoring. So post assisted log jam uh, is another technique. Uh, it's basically, you know, it's it's pile of sticks uh, secured with posts. And so anyway, um, they can be attached to one bank. They can be in the middle to encourage 
um, the channel to braid or they can be channel spanning to slow things down. We often combined the two, putting a little bit of more of like a BDA like base to them to make it solid and then uh, or building up against the logs in a higher energy system, as you see here on the right, the picture on the right. And this particular one, we did not build it solid all the way across. We purposely left it um, under a solid it was very stable, already sort of undercut bank. Uh, so we encouraged the water to go that way to create a better lateral scour pool, create some fish habitat in this stream and encourage bar building on the um, closer side there. Another technique we used a bit. Um, this is one we just kind of, I just kind of put some principles together um, from other restoration um, and um, so for high eroding banks in higher energy areas, uh, we found it's very simple to put in multiple lines of posts and kind of um, install a shelf. You basically don't put the brush all the way to the stream bottom and leave a little space under there. So you're, you're basically recreating an undercut bank at an outside meander. And um, this worked quite well. You can see there was a high eroding bank there. Um, we didn't do that the right side. There's, you can see there's a kind of to the right of where all the green brush is on that top right photo um, that is still kind of a raw bank there. Um, the water wasn't really aiming there and some of that actually happened during construction, but we uh, partially cut a tree and hung it over there for cover and to kind of help protect that. And actually the, um, it it didn't scour anymore. The water actually wasn't really hitting down there. So anyway, this allowed the bank angle to change and the, the grass to regrow on there. And now there's a nice undercut bank there. So we found that's a really nice technique and we use that on the main stem of basin above the reservoir. And I would um, look at doing this in other areas where you have higher energy streams with those high cut banks um, just to keep gravels cleaner and allow some more fish habitat. OK, so at the new sites in Basin, we installed 22 BDAs on oh, Basin 1, Basin 2, 19 BDAs plus three BDA PALS hybrids. And Basin 3, which is on the main stem um, upstream of the reservoirs, we put three um, post and bank brush protection structures like I showed you that was from that site and then three PALs and three partial BDAs. These were larger. We built these all purposely fairly porous, um, allowing a lot of the water, water energy to go by because this was a higher energy system than you can really do uh, as far as um, you know, slowing the water and pooling it completely without being there to maintain it fairly often. At the existing sites on Blacktail, we maintained 12 BDAs and five wildlife browse exclosures. I'll show an example of the browse exclosures in a, in a little later. And then um, we did not go back to BT01 and 03 under this grant, but we did um, go back to that otherwise. So here's an example of the monitoring network. There were, there were multiple elements to monitoring. Uh, we had hydrologic monitoring, we had biological monitoring um, of, with uh, fisheries, and um, then just kind of physical monitoring of how did the channel and the structures respond over time. Uh, so the most of the effort was in hydrologic monitoring. We we're really trying to get at, um, did we raise the groundwater table? Did it affect the stream flow? Uh, is this making any difference? So when um, I assisted Montana Tech students with installing piezometer transects to uh, monitor the shallow groundwater across the floodplain at multiple sites. Um, these were in place at two, actually three of all three blacktail sites and then to the two basin sites that are on small tributaries to the main stem of basin. And um, so with this, we also installed staff gauges and flow surface flow monitoring stations so they could tie the two together and then having some automated equipment, pressure transducers, which are a way to get at the stream flow or uh, stage and the temperature loggers, which also um, both of those can help with gauging the um, surface water groundwater interactions. <clears throat> um, and then some hydrologic modeling, and please don't ask me about that because I don't know 
really much about what he did. So this is all for Evan Norman's thesis. And um, it's it's very, um, a lot of different type of monitoring and a big effort. Um, and so anyway, it, it uh, the hydrologic modeling was kind of predictive of um, what would you expect to see given the soils and the water. And so he did quite a bit of the hydrogeology in there as well. Some of the conclusions from his study, um, he found groundwater levels are higher with less seasonal fluctuation in the treatment reaches, meaning where we actually did the restoration versus the control reaches. Uh, so that was, we kind of knew that would happen. Um, that was not a surprise just from what other studies have seen. Um, but yes, so putting these the system even after a few years or especially actually after a few years, um, the groundwater elevation was higher and we made the meadows wetter. Um, it does take a little while on some of these projects for the system to fully respond. So the response was actually stronger in um, year two or three versus the first year after restoration. He found a post restoration change in stream flow in the control reaches um, of negative stream. Oh, here we go again. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why this is doing this, but anyway. So um, found that stream flow actually went down um, in some of the control reaches where no treatment was done, um, but also um, there was an increase um, at, in stream flow at times in um, post restoration. Um, so it's good to be able to tie this to sites you know to have some control sites where no treatment was actually done in the treatment ranges where we actually did the restoration those gains were continuously positive so the stream flow um, average did did get um, more and it was more surface water uh, so you know it, it's not it's very hard to pin down and um, he had to do a lot of extra monitoring, install extra stations from when he started out to even be able to pin anything down. Um, That's one of the hardest things to do is really gauge this, the surface water response. But he did see that there is quite a, an influx from the groundwater. And then during low flow periods, um, both control and treatment reaches went down in, in low flow. Um, the treatment reaches went down less overall, um, but the basically the the recharge um, kind of you know there's a lot of recharge early season that groundwater gets recharged and then just doesn't um, it doesn't stay high throughout the year, uh, so um, it it doesn't last through base flow at the level it was. In the drier years, the treatment reaches where we did the restoration show a greater overall storage of water and movement of water from groundwater to the stream compared to control sites. So we are getting, um, basically we're doing that, that what we hope to do is get more water, uh, staying, getting into the floodplain and staying there long enough to improve, or I should say increase uh, late season flows in the streams. Again, this was a fairly complex, uh, I think a fairly subtle effect. Um, so in addition, we uh, Montana FWP agreed to do fisheries monitoring because they were concerned about us doing these projects. They were afraid that we would increase the number of brook trout um, or that basically the brook trout would respond better than the West Slope cutthroat. So we used the uh, two of the uh, blacktail sites as kind of the, the pilot projects, the, the test site. And so they set up monitoring reaches. So uh, 2016 is prior to restoration. So um, the blue is the West Slope cutthroat. Um, the top, um, so the top two graphs are fish count um, at the Brewer site and then at the Shonen site. And so at both sites, the West Slope cutthroat increased more than the brook trout did and stayed higher. Um, and if you look at the fish lengths, the average on the West Slope cutthroat actually is lower. Um, brook trout do tend to grow faster, but also 
Uh, part of it is that the uh, we did see quite a bit of um, quite a few young West Slope. They they obviously were using the areas to spawn. Um, the overall number declined after 2018, partly because the structures kind of you know started to get degraded. They had, where they were not being maintained um, at, after that point. Um, but and so the pools went down, but also because this caused the channel to because it was accessing its floodplain, the channel started moving all around the floodplain, so it would form new channels. Some of it got filled in um, with sediment, which is what you want. You want a channel to be changing constantly in this, you know, where you can allow this um, to have multiple channels kind of be the big swampy mess that it was historically in areas where it's not, you know, encroaching on um, any development or anything. So this was actually a, a good thing, um, but that's they couldn't monitor some of the same reaches because the system was uh, was so active again. Uh, so that was just kind of a um, qualitative, I guess, um, response. Uh, so the other thing we we took photo points uh, to look at changing conditions and also um, went through to close up the grant. Um, the last thing I did was go through and at every structure look at what was the condition of the structure and what was the channel response to it and just taking notes. And so I had my you don't I, you know I didn't put this up for you to read the table or anything and it's much more extensive because I did all of the structures. So this is just a little snip from it, but. The structure condition, um, was it there but kind of degraded? Is it basically intact? Um, did it get buried with sediment, which actually we like because that means the channel is um, the channel is higher than it used to be. And when that sediment deposits, then that, that structure stays really stable and all of the water table comes up. And so that's great. The vertical failure, um, when it basically digs a hole around the water, digs a hole around the post or through an upstream ramp. That's that's more of the problem and that's when you get the under scour. So that's more of a failure there when you have that um, channel response. Um, we looked at is it cutting around one end, but the dam is in place, meaning we increase the sinuosity of the stream. Uh, is there through flow? And we found this quite a bit. And this was one of the, the lessons we got out of this because we had to build with pine because there weren't really willows in the area yet. Um, we ended up with pretty coarse structure of the dams. And so over time, when the needles go away, you know, the, the weave is actually somewhat, um, it, it's just hard to build it as, as solidly. And so it ends up being a little more skeletal. It, they still generally backed up a little water, slowed it down enough to increase the, the water retention in the floodplain, but it tends to then kind of become a little skeletal and the water level drops. So that was not a total failure. It's just the um, because of the materials over time they degrade. Um, under scoured that we pretty much it's not doing anything at that point. So then it just becomes a fish fort. It's not really doing anything other than adding, you know, like food into the stream and and some shelter. Pools filled with sediment. That's when you um, that's usually paired with the thing got buried. Um, pooling intact. We didn't have that many pools that stayed intact, but where we had a lot of these and the water table was still high, we did have some small pools still. Um, overtop structure and um, would mean that it was completely intact. And then anastomos, that means just that we caused channel braiding or a, a side channel to be um, reconnected. So those are the things we looked for. Um, and basically the results were all over the board. Um, you know, some of there was varying um, ages of the structures since they had been maintained. This was some of the earliest work we've done in the state. Uh, so some of our, you know, it was kind of earlier build techniques and we've learned some stuff since then. So I was just doing this monitoring to really teach myself and kind of inform others doing this on what works and what doesn't. So just learning, uh, you know, but I'm finding that techniques in different soil types have to change too. So, um, you know, we're, we're just gathering the information and, and to make these more successful over time. Um, wildlife browse exclosures were uh, something we, we just noticed walking in these wet meadows that there are actually thousands of willows there in some of uh, some areas, but they're all browsed by wildlife down mm. to sedge height. So we put in these browse exclosures. Um, you can see on the top right one, 
I have a post marked by foot increments there, so I could just gauge how many feet the um, willows grew um, and, you know, just for photo points. And so there are willows um, in the foreground. You can barely see the leaves, the broader leaves there among the sage. That's what most of the willows looked like. Um, this is about, two, let's see, at this point, it would have been two and a half to three years, I think, um, of growth here. And it's actually slower than I've seen in some areas. And I believe that's because of the high elevation. Um, and then this worked for aspen groves too. So the wildlife really keep those new raiments, the new sprouts from the aspen um, browse down. And so I have found this at other sites in the upper Clark Fork, just throwing some um, temporary browse exclosure around aspen, uh, older aspen until the new shoots grow up to you know, be able to withstand browse is a great way to get back some regeneration. So that's kind of what the, the project entailed. Um, and, um, you know, moving forward, I don't know who would do it. This is not saying give me money. Um, this is what I noticed would be helpful because and or cost effective. We already have the wetland delineation done at BT04. Um, and the wetland delineation, um, because that is required on public lands, um, that that actually, um, that with the reporting and the pre-construction notification, the, the whole permitting process for these still on public, on some public lands is um, quite expensive and it uses up half the budget of, you know, half the restoration part of the budget. So um, might as well go in if there's um, availability there. Um, I think that the basin site projects, um, those, BT01 through 03 could do a lot more and it would be worth doing if we're going to have monitoring on them. So um, the current monitoring effort or the, the, the monitoring effort under this project is done. Uh, so it would be great though to have those um, upgraded, the projects expanded. So then I would love to see another um, Montana Tech project going in where we actually did a water budget and used extrapolated that to the watershed above the reservoir because I mean this is the state of the reservoir was the state of the reservoir last fall I believe when I was there and I'd never seen it so low um and uh anyway just it would be great to get an idea and an actual water balance to see can we actually make a difference if we look at all the areas that have this potential would it make any difference to the inputs to the reservoir and then the um there are a lot of other people in the Blacktail Creek watershed um, who want to see, who want to have these projects. Um, I've been um, told that there, there are a few different landowners and um, even on the projects we have, we could expand them more to, to make them more effective. So that is another um, potential for, for future. So that is what I have. Um, I did, there's a lot more detail in the completion report. Uh, so anyway, I encourage it's such a good read. You might as well. Um, anyway, um, I encourage you to read that if you are able and um, we will also have more information. Uh, CFWEP has a story page, um, a story map um, through their website on this project and we're hoping we can expand what they have on online <clears throat> this year. Or, or soon, maybe a winter project to get more of this new info on there. So there will be other information, but you can also contact me at that um, email. Great, thank you so much, Amy. That, that was great information. Um, anyone on the council with questions for Amy? No, no questions. Go ahead, John. So Amy, uh, what what's the... Uh, status of the recommendations where do we go from here to implement them well i think the best way would you know obviously that there's the funding component you know so What's that? obviously there's the funding component that's not really you know my <laughs> my bailiwick that's you know not my decision at all um but i you know if it would be easy to mobilize it um, 
if the funding is in place, but I would really recommend touching base with Montana Tech. They've built a whole program around monitoring this low tech. They've had multiple student projects on this. Um, I think, you know, with um, all the all the talent that's at that school, um, I think it would be fantastic to touch base with them and get a plan to develop. OK, how would this happen? And then that would help you determine, OK, what do we need to find? Whether it's like this would only be matched for maybe a much larger water grant um, to do this kind of thing um, as far as the, the modeling and all of the, the monitoring that would go with this. Um, if the um, if there were another grant coming out or another source of funding locally that could fund the restoration and expansion of the monitoring network in there and get them started, um, then that could be match for the larger grant. So I guess, you know, it would be a case of just hammering out, OK, what exactly do we need to do? But I would use the expertise of of Montana Tech. Um, the restoration end is easy. We can we can handle that um, very, very easily um, of what is needed there. So. I'd like to add to Amy's response. Um, so I think most of you are aware that NRD has the larger Upper Clark Fork River Basin Settlement, and there's an aquatic and terrestrial plan that came out in 2012. And they set money aside for each tributary, and Blacktail Creek received, I think it was 973,000. And I'm not sure if we've even spent half of that for lack of partners and good projects. Um, we are working with um, the Butte Country Club to address some issues on their property. Uh, we did a fish uh, ladder at Red Ferns property where uh, Connell Drive and Highway 2 come together at the nine mile. And then we've had some other projects, uh, but in Ray is at 2025, they're going to make another call or 2023, another call for mm -hmm. projects. We wrote the restoration plan 2023. So there's potential there, John, for people to come forward and sponsor a project on Blacktail Creek. Um, and also one thing I'd like to point out too is one of the bigger projects that we identified on Blacktail, uh, there's several um, culverts that zigzag underneath Roosevelt Drive. And we had looked at those uh, after we did the assessment in 2013 with FWP and the Clark Fork Coalition and Trout and Lemon and then WRC, and we identified those as one of the biggest issues because the the cutthroat can't get upstream once they're down there on the at the base of uh, Highway Two, and we looked at redoing seven of those culverts because they're basically perched. So the outlet of the culvert is up here and the creek is down here. So there's no way for fish to get back up in the culvert and go upstream. And when I was with Butte Silver Bow, one of the uh, nice things that we had happen is we put in for two federal land access program grants to redo Roosevelt Drive and one to do Molten Road. And we were successful on getting that grant for Roosevelt Drive. It's about a I can't remember, it's $6 million grant, and Beat Silver Bow had to put in a 13.5% match. Um, but the Federal Highway Administration is going to redo Roosevelt Drive from Highway 2 all the way up to the end. And it's a turnkey job, so they'll take it from design all the way through build. And that will probably, um, I would guess the earliest it would happen is starting next season. But that was a big deal that. NRD was looking at doing those culverts, and that was probably a third of that 900 some thousand. So that money now won't have to go into these culvert projects because the flat ground will take care of it. So I mm -hmm. uh, didn't mean to get in the weeds, but John, there is hope for blacktail. And the one thing that came out of our assessment when we did that 2013 is a lot of the people on that crew were very impressed with what a good stream especially for an urban stream that Blacktail really is. So lots of cutthroat, lots of brookies, and kind of the, the idea now is to try and minimize the amount of brook trout habitat and increase the West Slope cutthroat trout habitat. And that's one of the goals. And when we come out with that plan next year, hopefully somebody will step forward with project ideas like that, John. Yes. 
to add on to what you just said, Pat, and I, I, I had a question on what is it about this this kind of restoration that increases the the cutthroat numbers versus the versus the brookies? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And neither does yeah, neither I... neither do any of the the guys with FWP that worked on it. Um, maybe they maybe they have ideas that I. I didn't hear, but um, no, we all, I mean, the fear was that slowing down the water would improve habitat for the brook trout. Um, it could be the patterns of deposition of the fines. Um, I actually had a scare that um, I had, I, I called Jason Lindstrom, who was the FWP fish bio up here at, at the time, and I was like, am I in trouble? Because um, we, when we built the BDAs, it caused all this, you know, the channel to really make changes and it trapped all the sediment and completely filled in the channel in one part of them and then shoved it uh, over the on the floodplain into other areas. And um, it was great, except that I thought that, well, maybe I had buried a whole bunch of cutthroat reds, but he said that, um, no, they're used to that. And they actually, they spawn right after the sediment plumes happen <laughs> so um but it's all it's you know it's coarse material and i just don't know like if all that new kind of the new deposition if that's actually better for cutthroat or if it's because we have so many different little channels um and you know i really couldn't tell you why we were just tickled to see it though um that you know those we hardly saw any fish in the streams when we were there on the blacktail sites before we started. And I mean, we went back the next couple of years and just little little fish all over in the pools. And that was great to see. And now we're starting to hear frogs. And it's just, I mean, yeah, it's wonderful. But um, I really, I don't know. I, I did expect more brook, but I was really happy that we didn't get that response. <laughs> so. Great. Uh, to follow up with Amy's response, um, so I have talked with the new Upper Clark Fork River Basin fish biologist, and his name is Caleb Yearling, and he's going to come talk to us this fall. Um, they're going to do another uh, fish census work. Um, they typically do it twice a year, and once they do it, uh, typically in September, and then once he gets his numbers, he's going to come talk to us. So probably October ish. And you can ask them that question. <laughs> OK. All right, any other questions from the council? Go ahead, Courtney. Amy, um, how, you mentioned that you were there late or early fall, I should say. That was the last time you were up there. Yes. Uh, so when was yeah. that? That was. Trying to think it was it would have been early, early fall. I believe I don't think no, I did go into. I believe I think I was actually in there in November on doing the last monitoring on the last two sites. So uh, the reason why I'm asking is the pictures you took had snow, so I presume that that was oh. a fairly recent snow event or. No, no, no. some of the pictures I took um, that had snow, those would have been right after construction we actually did some of our building in the snow so that was so i had some immediately post construction pictures so the ones on um that i showed of us building the like the bank structures we were actually working in a bit of snow there so um the initial and then and then the um the last picture would have been from late summer this last year so there was that that one didn't have snow. How frequent are you able to get up there? Not enough. Um, I kind of blew through more budget than I wanted to with uh, travel. Uh, getting up there, and that's that's one reason I, I engaged um, Montana Tech students to do some of the, you know more of the monitoring because we realized there's no way we could do decent monitoring um, with me having to to travel up there out of town. So, um, but. I got up there, mm, you know, I probably three or four times, so about once a year, I guess, on average, um, other than like when I was really helping them 
set up the, the network and, and during construction is kind of a little more frequent then, but. And, and um, you said you cut down a few trees beside the ponds. Um, there's no concern for increased evaporation or lack of shade when you do that? No, because what we did, um, mostly these are really broad meadows and there weren't big ponds. It's um, very, it's sedge dominated with tiny little stream there. And um, so the sedge is actually doing most of the shading and the trees are, uh, um, we cut them from the edge of the meadow, not from the edge of pond, of big ponds. Um, and even so, you know, I, I was involved in some modeling um, of, of tree effects on temperature on larger areas, larger streams, and um, on something, it was actually on the Big Hole River, and we found that the, the, the tree canopy really, um, as soon as it's only like 10% of the shade is, is not really doing that much. Um, so um, anyway, that's an aside, but yeah, we definitely didn't have to worry about the shade element. Um, and when we cut them actually in the meadow, it's because those were ones that we were hoping to make unhappy anyway by raising the water table. So we wanted to, you know, just use them, um, you know, to to build materials um, because we were hoping to stop the <laughs> stop it from turning into forest habitat when we wanted to maintain the wet meadow and more ponded. Um, but we were not building big ponds. I mean, the I don't know if you saw it on the picture of the the BDA and it was you know, we basically are only ponding to about the high water mark in the channel, which up there was only a few feet wide. So um, we did in a couple spots manage to plug breaches in historic beaver dams, but we tried that on some of the larger dams and found that we make, when we make a big pool, um, there's just too much pressure. And because we aren't there to maintain it all the time, like beavers are, that is actually the hardest place to keep structures in place. You, you get a lot more from actually building um, in the in the channel um, and doing a whole bunch of them through the system. You mentioned that also you used uh, pine trees or junipers uh, yeah. to help store ones. up some. Uh, you know the tendency for those to decay is is acidic and does does acid play a role in the water is anybody measuring ph um and does that affect fish differently from other fish huh. i don't know if the increased acid would do it um i somebody did monitor ph i believe but i don't know if it was i i read a few student student papers and I believe somebody monitored pH. Um, we were not that concerned. A wet meadow setting, um, this has pretty high organics and I would think was, you know, the baseline would be alkaline in that system, I think, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there's somebody in the room who probably knows that more than I do, the, the water chemistry up there. But anyway, um, yeah, we would not expect to actually change that much because there's already so much organic material in the decayed from the decayed sedge roots and stuff it's really fibrous soil on top and then underlain by clay so we've got a lot of organics in there already which is what's going to create that that acidic system um, i don't know about the effects of you know by lowering the ph a little bit if that affects certain fish other than others though okay, and you mentioned wildlife any particular ones that you could tell deer, moose, elk? They were so many. <laughs> um, one thing That's I good to know. <laughs> I love animals. Uh, yeah. Two more questions. Um, uh, you said you haven't returned there since last fall. What do you think it looks like now? Is it pretty high in water table, et cetera, with all the snow and melt, snow melt, rain we were getting? I'm guessing it is, and um, I was I was going to get over there. Um, I'm hoping that I will be able to get back over there. Getting getting up to the Basin Creek sites is always kind of an extra effort because I have to get through the gates, and it's it's a hike in after you know, depending on how many trees have fallen across the road and all that. <laughs> but uh, you know, worth it. It's just um, so I'm hoping I can get there late summer fall. Um, it should be pretty high this year, but I was surprised even after a couple really dry years, 
how much water was still in the system. I was very encouraged by that, actually. So um, even though a lot of it is is much, you know, it, it never looks like it does right after the build. It starts to, the pools really go down, but I could see that the water was still there um, in places that I would have expected really to be high and dry otherwise, so. Then my last question, you don't have to answer this. Uh, can you tell me about the hydro, hydrologic cycle, please? <laughs> Just kidding. Can I use both sides of the page? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, Amy. Any other questions? Anything from, from the public? Any questions for Amy? Go ahead, Robert. Hi, uh, Barry Tao uh, from Montana Tech, and I, I knew those projects with uh, Evan uh, Norman, and I was trying also to help them with another student. And actually, there was another uh, restoration certificate project out of this that you didn't even mention, uh, where we tried to monitor how vegetation responded to the BBAs. But it, yeah. I would say it wasn't really successful, as you said because the system is just takes time to react. So we were suspecting that, you know, nearby where the water levels increased compared to earlier levels, there will be much more wet loving species coming in and maybe in a bigger abundance, but really we didn't find really a lot of significant trends. So I'm kind of just asking you, uh, when do you think that could happen? You saw a lot more BDAs than I did, and so if we would like to monitor changes, how and I helped actually Andy Bobes to do uh, his size down in the uh, Centennial Valley. So how and he's kind of find something similar that the system needed time to react. How long? As for um, veg. You're talking about vegetation. OK, so yeah. um, is that with wildlife browse or without wildlife browse? Because um, so, that you know, that makes a huge, that makes all the difference for the shrubs. As far as the, um, I've seen different things as far as the, um, you know, just the herbaceous, like the sedges, grasses, you know, kind of like the composition of, is it turning more to wetland versus, you know, kind of a, a drying community? Um, you know, have we managed to reverse the trend to be dominated more by wetland plants? Um, I've seen changes in a year in the centennial um these sites a lot of where we're working there's already a lot of sedge in there and that dominates the whole i mean it's got such heavy cover and there i i did notice um qualitatively that um you know some of the the areas that had more kind of bluegrass had more sedge and kind of the wetter more aggressive grasses. So I would expect, um, and that was maybe in two to three years, and that's what I would expect. I would expect it would take at least two growing seasons to start seeing kind of that shift, but um, that's if the, the water table is there consistently, which we've at the edge of the meadows, um, because these are such small streams and these are not actually really flat meadows, um, you better pick your spot very carefully because the, the water table can be high and then fluctuate way down enough that you're not going to get that change very fast. Um, so if you can find areas to monitor that where um, it's going to be kind of a, a consistent elevation, so we know that we are we're keeping that fairly well saturated for a good part of the growing season then you should see the change within a couple of years. But it is very tough to to fit into, you know, a student project that's only going to be a couple of years. This is this is kind of, you know, yeah. it's kind of a longer trend thing to see anything significant, I would think, unless you're talking about, you know, fencing and the shrubs coming back, then that's a gimme, you know, but. Thank you. Yeah, and um, I did. Um, I did see, you know, I, I had heard about the vegetation study and, and kind of back and forth on if it was going forward, if it was, you know, if it was going to work. Um, and I, so just so you know, when I summarized uh, research, I don't think I put that one in the report though, um, but I, you know, uh, in this presentation, I was trying to keep it to what this grant, this Butte Area One grant actually funded. Um, and so, it's hard to it's hard to tease out um, because 
you know, you guys just ran with, the, you know, we kind of helped set a foundation. You guys just ran with it and built this wonderful pro, um, kind of program. So um, thank you for that. Um, and anyway, so there's a lot of research, just so everybody knows, that's that has, it, it's kind of scaled up to include a lot more research than what this actually directly funded. So anyway, and just a note there. Even about that study because we were just kind of collaborating with Evan and uh, and uh, yeah, so we were just writing on it. We didn't receive additional funding for this or anything like that. So we just went out and, and looked at Ledge at okay. the same size as, as Evan. Oh, I see. OK, well, we should change that anyway. <laughs> There's a recommendation. All right, any other questions for Amy? Okay, we'll move on to Jeff. Um, Amy, thank you very much. Um, appreciate your time. Um, I did post Amy's report on uh, the MDOJ website under the BNRC, so hopefully it's there. I actually didn't look for it lately, but if you can't, if you want to, you want it, send me an email. I'll drop you a link. Um, also, I recall that Evan came to the BNRC and presented his work oh, probably three or four years ago. I'll try and dig out his presentation too, and if you want it, I can send that to you as well. Amy, we sure appreciate your your uh, willingness to come present <laughs> after this long amount of time and and your time to do that and and all of your work up there. It looks it's it's a neat project. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, listening. And um, yeah, hopefully. Hopefully good things will continue to happen up there. One last plug. Nobody asked me why not just leave it to Beaver. Um, and uh, that's because the, the habitat isn't there anymore. So we have to get the shrubs back. So that's a recommendation is getting more sh more shrubs and, and getting more of the aspen um, regeneration. There are some aspen up there, but they're a little harder and they're, they're kind of getting crowded out. So anyway, um, if we can uh that used to that used to be the policy to trap out beavers up there um it may still be but now there is a water treatment plant so i'm hoping that can change um because that's actually why um apparently why the beaver ponds are no longer there is because the policy was just keeping them under control to um because of fear of giardia because it was an untreated um reservoir so anyway i'm um, hoping that that because that could do more to store water above the reservoir than anything if we can reset the the framework so the beavers can actually be successful there. So that's my last little preachy bit at the end. So anyway, thank you very much Perfect. for your attention. Thank you. All right. Bye. So next we have uh, Catherine Hosrup, and she is going to talk to us about uh, paragraph 96 from the View Priority Soils Operable Unit Consent Decree. She's coming to us this evening from Helena. So thanks, Catherine, for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can. Thank you. Great. Yeah, um, and before I launch into my presentation, uh, can I just remind everyone when you make comments, if you could use your first and last name, it'll be easier for our admin staff for the meeting summaries. So um, that would be great. So yeah, I'm Catherine. I'm an attorney with the Natural Resource Damage Program. And um, as it says on the agenda, I'm going to talk about the Butte CD uh, and more specifically about paragraph 96, which is a particular provision where uh, British Petroleum Atlantic Richfield, which I will just call BPAR, uh, reserved the right to sue the state for certain restoration actions. Um, and so more broadly, as most of you know, the Butte CD was entered in 2020, and it comprehensively covers the final remedy in Butte Priority Soils Operable Unit, except for the Residential Metals Abatement Program, which is the Residential Soils Cleanup, which we don't really uh, deal with at NRDP. So. For us, it's a, a comprehensive cleanup. Um, and of course, the CD doesn't address Westside Soils because that's a different operable unit. Um, 
And uh, as you, a lot of you know, the CD covers a lot of uh, remedy and legal requirements that uh, I can't really get into tonight because it's just to, it's thousands of pages. But I do know that the Butte Area 1 Restoration Plan uh, and amendments uh, directs NRDP to coordinate on the remedy. Um, and of course, CERCLA does as well. And so, uh, and we also have the charge to ensure that restoration funds are not spent on remedy. And so I do think this would be a good topic to have a more comprehensive discussion of the CD if that's something that the BNRC is interested in. I know you're interested in the progress of remedy. Um, so I would suggest that maybe would be an, a good future topic, but we would probably need to invite uh, EPA and, and DEQ for that. So if that's something that the BNRC is interested, probably uh, we, you can mention it at the end and we could try to schedule something for a future meeting. But for me, I'm going to focus specifically on the NRD interest in the CD, which uh, is related to the $20.5 million payment to the state and BPAR's reservation to sue the state in paragraph 96. And in order to understand this, I think there's some background that's necessary. Um, so if you remember, the state did not concur in the record of decision, which is the document that lays out the final remedy back in 2006 because the selected remedy did not include removal of the parrot tailings and also did not include north side tailings and diggings east, which it eventually did, of course, as you know. Uh, and then we spent the next several years fighting and not making a lot of progress. And so then Governor Bullock decided it, uh, it was impeding negotiations. So the state would use restoration funds to remove the parrot tailings and we would stop trying to have it be part of remedy. Uh, back then, the governor and the state as a whole said, well, we're going to do this, but we expect a significant contribution for restoration uh, towards the cost of the parrot cleanup as part of the CD, a, si a significant contribution of funds from BPAR. And this expectation is laid out in the 2019 parrot funding amendments, but the amount of BPAR's payment was not publicly known at the time. Uh, and the part of the reason that it um, we came at this sideways was because BPAR has felt strongly that they settled for the parrot back in the 2008 consent decree. And so they had settled all of their natural resource damage liability in Butte. And so the trying to get additional restoration funds uh, would be problematic. Um, so instead, the agreed upon, what we all came up with was that there would be a significant overpayment uh, to the state as a whole to DEQ to perform the Blacktail Creek remedy. That, that BPAR would pay $20.5 million to the state um, with the remainder to go to restoration and with the understanding that this was much more than the cost of the Blacktail Creek remedy. Uh, the 2020 uh, Rod Amendment uh, describes the cost of Blacktail Creek as $5 million. Uh, of course, that was $20, $20. Uh, who knows what will happen in the future? It's several years out. But so there was clearly this expectation that a lot of funds would go to NRDP for restoration with uh, very few strings attached because um, as CERCLA provides, EPA doesn't provide oversight over restoration actions. And because of this sort of this structure that we had where we were going to get money on the back end and um, without oversight from EPA and BP was concerned about that. Uh, and specifically, BP is concerned about their subdrain and potential damage to the subdrain. Um, or somehow some damage to the Butte Treatment Lagoons. And so we also didn't want to damage the subdrain or Butte Treatment Lagoons, uh, which brings us to paragraph 96, which is what I'm supposed to be talking about after that long background. So um, I think you kind of understand what BP's concerns were. Um, and in paragraph 96, uh, BP reserved the right to sue the state if EPA requires remedial action because the parrot tailings impacts the subdrain and ends up requiring maintenance or repair of the subdrain from the parrot tailings work, or if the parrot tailings work somehow increase contamination to the butte treatment lagoons, whether a new contaminant or a di an additional quantity of contaminated water or more of an existing, you know, just a higher concentration of a contamination in the water. Um, or more importantly for your 
purposes tonight. Um, if there was something else that we spent the money on, another restoration action, if that restoration action all did some sort of damage to uh, a remedial structure. And we felt confident that uh, NRDP, that is, felt confident we could agree to this because, of course, we don't want to damage the subdrain or Butte Treatment Lagoons. That's obviously a very reasonable request. Um, but we did want to make sure that we didn't end up um, in endless disputes over this, over um, maybe small disputes or if, uh, so we wanted there it to be some sideboards on when this could actually happen, that we could end up in a, a legal dispute with BP because they're you know, obviously a huge company and uh, yeah, NRDP is essentially me, I'm the legal team. So, um, the, so we had, we agreed upon in paragraph 96 that the damages, um, BP has to show what portion of the damages are actually caused by the parrot or the, the other restoration action, that it has to be more than a million dollars of damage, and that uh, uh, BP has to show this within five years of completion of the parrot work or of completion of the, um, the other restoration action, so that we wouldn't get dragged into some dispute 20 years down the line for some other reason. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that we wouldn't get tagged with having to replace the sub drain uh, if it failed, that only maintenance, not capital improvements would uh, apply. So you're probably wondering why we're talking about this um, other than just general interest on the potential to be sued by BP. But uh, specifically uh, for future planning, um, the Butte Area 1 fund gets 35% of the leftover funds from DEQ's Blacktail Creek work. And if you remember, that's because uh, the other funds, the Groundwater Fund and the Upper Clark Fork River Basin Fund, paid for the other 65% uh, of the, the parrot. So the repayment is done on a pro rata amount uh, whenever we do get those funds. So there's a, a fairly significant portion of funds that would be subject to this uh, ability to sue us if the, the governor and, you know, with recommendations from the BNRC and NRDP chose a, re a restoration action in the future with those leftover funds that could potentially damage a uh, remedial structure. And so uh, paragraph 96 would apply to any of those actions funded with that 35% we get from the Blacktail Creek leftovers, as well as uh, our current work on the parrot tailings waste removal, even though a significant portion of the funding for the parrot tailings is actually from different restoration funds. It's not from Butte Area 1. But um, so paragraph 96 doesn't apply to anything besides the parrot right now. Um, because we haven't gotten those leftover funds yet from DEQ's Blacktail Creek work, and we probably won't get them for years to come. But I think it's also just important to remember that uh, under just general CERCLA requirements, any restoration action we take can't interfere with or damage remedy, I mean, appropriately so. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that we're working through a process as uh, not just this site, but other sites, we're, we're getting to the point where there's remedial structures or, or remedial caps that we want to do restoration on. And so um, we've worked through a process where there's a sign off from uh, BP just to make sure that we don't get crosswise with them if like a restoration action, say the reveg that we're talking about tonight, um, just to get them to confirm that it wouldn't damage the caps. Uh, that B BP has been responsible to put in under Superfund. So, um, so just to sum up, uh, paragraph 96, I guess I, people have heard some talk of it. Uh, it, di it is fairly unusual for a consent decree. It's a very specific um, multiple page paragraph uh, that does al allow BP to reserve certain rights to sue the state related to the parrot tailings project and re and related to any future restoration that is done with the leftover funds from the Blacktail Creek work, which are expected to be significant. In 2020 dollars, 
it was expected to be 50 million. I mean, we know that the cost of construction has gone up and the work won't be performed for several years. So that those numbers won't apply in the future, but we do know that there was a fairly significant amount of money that would come back to restoration and paragraph 96 applies to the portion that is spent that goes to repay the Butte Area One funds. So, but we feel we're taking good precautions at the Parrot. We're doing a fairly expensive monitoring program to make sure that the Parrot isn't doing any damage to the Butte Treatment Lagoons or the subdrain. And um, we think it was uh, overall a, a, an appropriate risk worth taking to get the CD entered. So, I don't know if there are more specific questions about the paragraph 96 or the CD that folks have that. I could try to answer. I mean, it is several thousand pages, but I could I could give it my best shot if anyone has any questions. Great, thanks, Catherine, for that great summary of of it all. Um, is there any questions from the council for Catherine? How about any questions from the audience? Everybody's asleep. Elizabeth, <laughs> I have a question. Um, okay. And have this, or Catherine, this is John from uh, the council, John McKee. Um, has the state in any way tried to claim in its documentation that the parrot work was actually remediation and not restoration, thereby obviating paragraph 96 entirely from the work we're doing there? No, I mean, so there's actually, that's a really astute question because obviously that was, an argument that we had for a very long time. But in order to get the deal done, we have a sentence in there that says solely for purposes of this uh, consent decree, the parrot is considered to be restoration. And then the way that paragraph 96 is defined, it refers to uh, the definition of state restoration means anything that's in the Butte Area 1 restoration plan, including the parrot tailings and amendments. So... It, it definitely would apply to the parrot and to any future restoration that's done with that portion of the leftover that comes back to repay the, um, the Butte Area 1 fund. Thank you. You're welcome. And so did I hear you say that any restoration that is done with those funds that, that then you would ask uh, BPAR to like sign off on that when it was done. Is that is so, that how that work? I think only the so obviously if we're doing something that's outside of a, a remedial area, that wouldn't be necessary. But specifically, just confirmation, like for the example being the um, reveg on the B res. I there I would assume they would have no concerns that that would actually do anything to the cap, but it is, uh, that that's kind of the, the place that it's come up. Um, if there was other restoration that uh, was on, like obviously could impact a, a remedial structure, then we would probably do it there as well. I'm having a hard time thinking of what that might be right now, but uh, I'm sure, you know, Butte is obviously filled with, uh, you know, okay, so let's say uh, some sort of action we wanted to take at BRW, we would have to be really careful that we were coordinating that appropriately with the remedy and not damaging it, right? So does the Blacktail Creek project, is that considered restoration or remediation? How does that one work? So the Blacktail Creek project is... Um, remedy there is a weird little part of it that's the confluence area is referred to as restoration integrated with remedy and that was to avoid the um i think it was because the state had always thought more should be done where that removal action had occurred and so rather than sort of re-argue that point uh we were willing to agree that uh, that portion of the project was restoration integrated with remedy uh, but it's subject to EPA oversight, the whole thing. So DEQ has to get approval from EPA on all of its work plans. It's considered remedy cleanup under 
super fun for the Blacktail Creek portion. And there's a whole there's a whole attachment actually that governs how the Blacktail Creek work will occur. In addition to the the work plans that are in Appendix C, Appendix D, Attachment C to Appendix D, the there's also this whole other Appendix H to the CD that cover, covers Blacktail Creek. Whereas the parrot actually, sorry, the parrot actually only has a couple paragraphs because we're completely, EPA has no approval authority over restoration actions. Right. Okay. Great. Any, any other questions? Paragraph 96. I don't, I don't see anything else. Thanks, Catherine. We sure appreciate your, appreciate your explanation. Yeah, you're welcome. And let us know if uh, if you're interested in uh, trying to schedule an update on remedy. Um, and if you remember, there was a portion of the 2020 amendment, I believe, that talked about uh, NRDP exploring opportunities to coordinate and things like that. So it might be a good, if that's something the BNRC is interested in, that might be good to schedule in the next six months or something. Sounds great. I, I actually wrote it down as you were saying it. So we'll, we'll be we'll be in touch <laughs> okay. for sure. Great. Thank you. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. I know that was a dense topic. Uh, if anyone has questions, um, you can talk to Pat or get my email or my I, I'm happy to talk anytime if there's more questions because I know it's a, a big it's an important topic to the BNRC. I understand that so. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, I think we're ready to go on to the to the plant part. Which who wants to go first? Oh, oh, okay, you know, I'll go together. Perfect. Before we would start, I just would like to actually introduce our new uh, vice chancellor for research here because she's also representing us from uh, Montana Tech, Dr. Angel Luking. And we have our previous uh, vice chancellor for research here too, Ben Hartline. So <laughs> they're both supporting us. Very, very great. Nice to meet you. Yeah, so I just thought you should. Julia, really, do you know if this has batteries? Doubt it. Doubt it, too. Lots of pointing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, I'm Abby Peltzma. I'm with Butte's Bow Department of Reclamation and Environmental Services. And I have with me here Dr. Robert Powell with Montana Tech and specifically the Native Plant Project. Um, he also runs the um, restoration certificate and it's like a one man band with it. And master's program, right? Um, we also have with us uh, Krista Weilich, who is also with Montana Tech Native Plant Project. Um, and then I also have Julia Crane and Brandon Warner here with the Department of Reclamation as well. Did I miss any? Okay. There we go. So um, just the outline for our presentation. So we're gonna just briefly go through a summary of those lessons learned. We thought it was kind of important though, because we do have some new members. Um, just so as we're kind of talking through some things, you're not like, why, why do you guys do that now? So just kind of a brief overview. And then if there's any other questions to that, we can dive in. Um, we'll also run through the 2021 summary, and then we'll merge into our fiscal year planting plans and then our respective planting program budgets as well. Um, first, to kind of start us off, right, so the goals back in 2012 when the first grants were submitted for this, right, um, if you look back through a lot of that stuff, the goals were to reestablish a diverse self-sustaining native plant community on the reclaimed areas of the Butte Hill um, with big goals in mind, right, minimize erosion and then also establish a self-sustaining ecosystem, okay. So with that all in mind, right, that's pretty big and lofty, right? 
uh, some of the lessons we've learned throughout this project, okay, is number one, right, appropriate species selection. We've prioritized a lot of Montana native plants. Um, all of the plants procured by Robert's program now are all Montana natives. So that's a huge transgression to that, right? And, and I would just add to that, yeah, because probably John would talk about the, the conference that we both particip participated uh, the climate change adapt adapt to climate change. I think that is one of the crucial things that our program could contribute to the future because they're all locally collective and uh, dry tolerant plants. Really kind of looking forward to kind of climate change, I would say. So I think that's a really important step in that. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the other lessons that we've learned from um, and kind of moved away from is we went from starting with these big tree pods, if you guys recall, with mature trees, um, and now we've moved all to planting areas with thousands of trees. Um, we've, I mean, just in the few short years I've been here, we've installed thousands of plants across the Butte Hill again. Um, so, and we've employed a lot of different techniques, right? So we've moved from scrapes, we've moved through rough and loose um, into previously repaired areas. We're gonna kind of talk about some of the things that we did this past season as well this year, just in relation to climate change and some of the things we're seeing on the sites. Um, we've moved from procuring plants from nurseries throughout the state to solely from Dr. Powell's Montana Tech Native Plant Program, um, which has been huge success. Um, the other thing we've kind of moved a lot into is, you know, weeding and site preparation. So being able to utilize bare sites that are created after hand weeding, which is where we're kind of going with a couple of the sites we worked on last year. Um, we've also immensely kind of honed in on our partnership. We work collaboratively um, during our planting season. Crystal and I are, are out every day um, and we're talking with Robert and Brandon and Julia and Eric and engaging kind of everybody. So it really has grown to be this real, really big collaborative effort. Um, we also retain Dr. Powell services to evaluate and verify our remedial maintenance plans um, and make sure that they're consistent with ecological objectives, especially as we're moving into these drier climate change. Um, if you guys recall Mark Mariano, he had a small project with BNRC um, and out of that came the Mariano model kind of to help guide where what kind of plants we should be utilizing across the hill. Um, and that has persisted throughout this whole program. So we rely on that still. And I would say besides that, uh, so we are emphasizing a lot of things that lessons learned. So there's a lot of research going into the program through Montana Tech. So every year we have um, a lot of volunteers in a way, uh, students who are doing their little uh, certificate projects or even their master's projects. And they're not even mentioned here. We mentioned Mark Mariano, but there was Jared, there was Joao. There are several other people that graduated out this year from the master's program and they all have some uh, lessons that we can we could put into this presentation because uh, they contributed to science and to the area so that's also a huge goal uh, founded this with this program so we just don't do uh, put plants out to the hill but we try to contribute to science and learn uh, that way and help the butte area mm -hmm. yeah and I would add not just masters, but also our undergrads. Yes. Because they are required to do a thesis for their senior project. So a lot of our undergrads have come to us and that's been very beneficial for them. Um, the other thing, um, we have collaboratively performed community outreach. So whether that's a community planting, I know a lot of times when we're out on the site, we get stopped all the time to talk about um, what we're doing there, what the goals are. Um, so as we're out there every day, we're also performing community outreach. Um, so on our end, on Butte Silver Bow End, we prepare the sites ahead of time. We monitor moisture, perform weed and browse control, um, and then also help with the plant installation. Tech generates this enormous plant stock for us, which has been so beneficial. Um, they're also performing seed collection. They're coordinating their staff and student installations. They're performing scientific observation, manual weeding, maintenance of the greenhouse. I mean, there's a lot going on on both ends. And then one of the big things, right, is the monitoring and evaluation. So diving into our 2020 summary, and I'm gonna turn it over to Robert for this slide. And that's just, again, uh, one of the lessons we just try to implicate. You know, we have been monitoring now throughout this uh, good number of years. And, you know, when to plant uh, really comes down to you know, we monitor and see what the survival uh, results are. And it really comes down to 
fault planting works really best in our area. Although this year was quite specific, we didn't expect that much spring precipitation. It could have been actually awesome this spring. I don't know that could turn into a horrible summer, but you know the plants going into the soil, enjoying that precipitation that comes late fall and uh, throughout the winter, they establish better and they they can just we don't need to worry about them. We don't water them anymore. They don't grow crazy. They don't grow big as myself in a year or two, but they're standing in and they're uh, that's kind of the best uh, way we found uh, approaching our plantings. It's definitely a lot more sustainable, which is all, what we're all I think trying to you know get more towards. Um, oh, go ahead. So uh, in 2021, kind of separating our program, the Navy plan program, and kind of just in a short summary what we did. So here are a couple of the numbers of uh, plants that we grew uh, with the program. We have a total of close to 10,000. We had a close, close to 10,000 plants uh, for the uh, 2021 season to work with. And now we have a similar number for 2022 to work with. Uh, collected seeds from 44 Navy plant species, that means a lot of millions of little seeds that are stored in our uh, fridge and they are good for years to come. Uh, we monitored uh, all the sites from the planting seasons of 2016 and 20. We, we monitor one year uh, after the, the installation and then four years after. <clears throat> and it's a good thing that again, we are at Montana Tech because we can work with our students and Above that, we have also volunteers that are signing up and uh, Crystal could talk probably a lot more about our volunteers. Sometimes we call the volunteers our students because they need to do some kind of a service, but sometimes they're just community members and they would like to work this summer. We have a couple. Uh, we have people who have been now working with us for years and for free. They come show up every uh, week, work for hours. Uh, I feel sometimes bad that there's this uh, lady uh, who comes in and and waters our plants every Friday and uh, for nothing just because she loves it. And, you know, that's that's kind of a really good thing. Um, just our uh, plant uh, staging area, believe it or not, <clears throat> that is like 13,000 plants. Uh, that was one of the uh, days when uh, we had a, a visit from BNRC uh, members and uh, by Len Ballack and some students working for the program. Great. Um, so our 2021 planting sites, so just to kind of summarize what we did this year, and I know you guys saw a presentation um, in December, I think it was, right? Where yeah, we kind Crystal. Of, yeah, where Crystal and I kind of summarized the work that we did. We made Crystal take lead on that. And she's out there every day with me, and she never takes the any credit. Um, so total, all total, we installed 3,971 plants. Um, we proposed, if you recall, 3,500, so just a little bit over. Um, but you'll kind of see why there's an addition of a site here. So on the ensemble dump, we installed 1,415, the mine yard, 1,116. The ensemble swale was an opportunistic planting um, that occurred, and I'll, just, I'll talk about that more in a minute, um, but we were able to install 120 plants there. And then at Scrap H, we installed another 1,090 there. Um, so variety aspects and slope here, and then again, all plants were grown and sourced by Montana Tech. So I'll kind of go high level because I know we've already seen this and I'll we'll talk about this again. But um, so the Anselmo dump, if you guys recall, if you guys can see this guy, if you guys recall in 2020, I believe it was, we actually planted on this will let me, we actually planted on the north part of this site. Um, and we actually installed scrapes here. And the reason we put scrapes here is because there was a high amount of plant litter that was accumulating there. So we, at that time, we decided scrapes were better for there. So we actually installed 1,500 there in 2020, okay? Um, this map that you're looking at, let me back up a little, is from our breeze evaluators. So the Butte Reclama Reclamation Evaluation System. So when they go out, they take certain things that come up on the site, like the red there is a mine waste area or exposed waste area that we need to go investigate. Um, the green might be some of the weeds that occur on the site. That tan is a barren area. So this is what, um, when I say evaluated in 2018, that was the last time our evaluators were on that site. They currently are on that site this year because they get evaluated every four years. Um, and so then subsequently, right on the back side of that, we're performing those repairs immediately after the season. So, um, so all of the things that were identified there that I just kind of talked about, 
we did go in and fix afterwards. So like the mine waste we fixed with the addition of topsoil and some fertilization, the barren area we interstitially seeded. Um, and then we also implemented weed control broadly across the site. And we did it a number of ways um, because with working with Dr. Powell, we've noticed, you know, mowing might be better, handling might be better, or chemical might be the best. It just depends on the species. I was out today at that site, and I we didn't put that uh, those pictures into this presentation, but I was actually amazed. I don't know if I can show myself on this is really one of good. the scrapes, and it's actually all the the native plants kind of flowering and coming up nicely, and they were just seeded in with uh, a native seed. Uh, I'm sorry, that's very unprofessional. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's funny because we actually brought Pat to this site because he was asking us for a good example, so we went there and we talked about it, and one of the biggest things is when we were planting, there was a giant buck that sat and like watched what we were doing. And he was like, God, yes, this is the best. <laughs> and we were like, so as we were planting, we had our summer laborer applying deer deterrent. And then last year, my summer laborer, he applied it every single month, which is another lesson that we've talked about that was learned. No browsing. They look so good. It's so minimal and they're just beautiful. So that's that, that is performing very well. So we chose again to continue on the south part of this site, um, which is south facing slope, a little bit different. Um, and looking at the breeze evaluations coupled with the Mariana model, um, we kind of decided to do a little bit different here because there wasn't the accumulation of plant litter. We decided that there were enough kind of little open spaces between the native grasses there and some of the species that were occurring um, that we weren't going to employ scrapes at this site. Um, and there's a couple, there's another reason to this, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so again, we previously performed the O&M. Uh, in this site, we did pull weeds by hand. Um, it took a while, but there's a couple reasons. We did not want the chemicals to inhibit new plant growth. We also didn't want it to inhibit cryptogramic crust, which we're going to get into in a second. Um, and again, we installed 1,415 plants. And then after that, we interstitially seeded with the native seed mix. That is on that top oh, picture. Yep. Um, students just um, you know, throwing out the seeds and raking it right away. And then that was last fall. And so this um, picture on the left here is what the site looked like when we started. And this was when we were done. Um, so it drastically changed with, you know, the decrease of weeds. Um, I mean, once you kind of got the weeds out of there, you could really see a lot of a lot of the natives and a lot of the crypto again really kind of came through. And that was again only possible with our students and volunteers because there was a lot of hands needed for that kind of work. Mm -hmm. And the reason again why Abby mentioned why we did that, and uh, probably some of you might have remember seeing this picture. Uh, you know, we had a greenhouse experiment showing also uh, a relationship between how the total biogas cover and the above ground biomass has a pro positive relationship. Uh, actually, um, Dr. Courtney Young pointed out, well, that actually R square value is really low. Well, it is, but the trend is significant and that's what we are happy. So we cannot predict that by, you know, 60% of a total biocrust cover, how much above ground biocrust we're going to get. But we can see a positive trend, which was significant again. That's good for us. Uh, that was just a result again for a, a greenhouse experiment. So they definitely help us. And just their coverage, it's valuable. So we don't really want to scrape them off right away if we can actually have other ways. Uh, and I understand that this is coming into the breeze evaluation as well. So that cryptogamic crust will be evaluation, evaluated as cover. Mm -hmm. So it's not just uh, vascular plants. Yeah. Um, so, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Um, some of the folks online on the Teams meeting are wondering if you oh. could share your screen. Ooh. Oh, geez. So sorry. Sorry about that. No, no. I totally overshot. Honey, in the bottom right. This one? Yeah, click that little share button on right by the Yep. Yep. Sorry for that, folks. And then click your screen with the three. There you go. Good to go. Can you guys see that now? See, it's not green. Right? No, it's not green. Can they get, can you see it? Just unmute yourself and let us know. Now it should be. Oh, it's red. Yeah, we should be. <laughs> so now we're good. That, can you guys see that now? 
threatening yes. to recording. Okay. okay. Oh, it's only recording because I remember green was funny. Oh, but they said but they hinted, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry for that oversight. Um, so moving on to our second planting site, um, we continued on the Anselmo Minard slope. If you recall again, we did employ scrapes there previously and had previously installed 2,500 plants. Um, we've kind of started, we kind of started on the west part of that slope and we've just kind of continued over east. Um, so this site, it is a south facing slope, so there was a lot of erosion. Again, and you know, weeds. plant litter weeds, which is why we chose to use the scrapes there as well. Um, there were some barren areas. We had some exposed waste sediment at the top of the slope there. Um, and then, like Robert said, weeds. So we had gone in previously. We implemented the weed control. Um, we also did soil addition, fertilizing, interstitial seeding with the barren areas. Um, and then we proposed to enhance these corrective actions with the installation of native plant diversity. So there again is um, our breeze findings. Um, so again, that red is that you know exposed mine waste that we talked about and our crews went in and did a really nice job, kind of a fresh planting area for us. So we actually were able to seed right there really nicely. Um, and then the whole green on the south part is the weeds. Again, so more justification to go in and scrape and kind of fix all of that. For, for those of you who are not, not everybody in this room knows about that Mariana model that one of our students actually designed. Just, just real mm -hmm. quick, so it actually shows different patterns, different colors here, and it's really taking into consideration the aspect, uh, elevation, the slope, and every, you know, those situations, and you know, what is uh, actually in the, in the site, and based on that, and based on the requirements of certain native plants, we kind of can have a map uh, to designate them to different sites. So it's kind of, you can see that in this area, you can see that, uh, I don't know, pale color and, and yellowish, greenish and, and purple or pink. Well, we kind of just really designated them for what the majority was. It's really hard to kind of pick those pinkish colored out, but, but yeah, we got the majority of the plants that were matching uh, the paler color to, to this area. That's, so that's very important because that was a south facing slope. We, we definitely couldn't work with, you know, like aspen or, or trees that have a higher water demand. So we really tried to go for shrubs and and forests that were having, uh, you know, less of a water requirement. And we actually did work successfully with uh, pines, lodgepole pine, and also with uh, limber pine. And we, I, we just checked them today. There's weeds, but there's a lot of diversity that got into that site yeah, and it survived well. Effect. Yeah. So again, more of the goal of moving with the drought tolerant where we need to. Um, so again, so some of these pictures are just kind of showing our crews out um, doing the scrapes to get us all prepared um, and then installation. Um, there was also um, a bit of stormwater run on that was occurring on the site. So we actually, our crews are our crews have been really good and Brandon's crews have been really good at identifying ways to kind of funnel those into a swale so that we could actually use that water for the plantings. Um, so they were able to do that. Um, the other thing you'll see here too is a giant wheelbarrow with mulch, especially because this is a south facing slope. Um, anything we can do to try to help it retain water or provide a little bit of shade or coolant. So mulch has been very beneficial on this site. Um, and I think we've remulched twice, right, mm -hmm. Crystal? And it's due to be again. Um, there was <laughs> an unanticipated event that occurred last June, um, in late June with firework season. Um, unfortunately, there was a fire on the site, um, but we kind of used, a, it was kind of really cool actually, because the next day we went out and the scrapes really provided protection. Um, there was minimal loss because of the scrapes, the mulching, and then also I would say our summer water, our summer labor watered the heck out of it, so. And, and the, then the reason also why the scrapes in a way survived where we put most of our efforts in, mm -hmm. because uh, these sites, these older sites tend to have a lot of leaf litter. So mm -hmm. as fireworks kind of landed, they kind of caught on and they kind of mosaically kind of burned around yeah. and, and leaving our uh, scrapes out. Mm -hmm. And for the grass, it didn't matter really whether it burned down the next year, this year, they're out again. So, yeah. but our plants were safe, but mm -hmm. just continue on that. Yes. Yeah. Well, and then it kind of made a nice little area for us to go in and plant in the fall. In the fall. So we, I mean, we had already planned plan to plant there anyways. 
Um, so we did successfully install 1,415 plants there in some of the space that was made by this fire that didn't happen. Um, the other thing that Dr. Pell and his team employed there were the restoration packs that you guys have seen in the past. So I'll let him talk and, to that. And that was because, you know, uh, at the, our last proposed the, the meeting that we, I don't know, it, it was when we proposed last year's site. And I think Elizabeth asked specifically, uh, we, we showed how these so-called restoration packs could work, could work really well in the Butte area. And, you know, some of our students took it as a research opportunity and um, installed a lot of those. So what it is, basically, it's nothing else but cardboards uh, shaped in a cooler, like, a, 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 is it the column? Just like a cylinder, yeah. A cylinder, mm -hmm. uh, and then we dig the lower part of the, the cylinder into the ground, and sometimes we even put rocks or, you know, uh, uh, firm them down to the soil. And what it does, what that you can see on this, on this picture, Oh, it doesn't work. OK, so OK, so <laughs> so you can see this is these are fringe stages. This is the fringe stage that didn't get the color, and this is a fringe stage that did get the color, and here is another one. We actually even try different kinds of other amendments like mulch and different kinds of fertilizers. So there is actually even uh, differences how they acted, but that little micro environment, that microclimate that those little colors could add to them, uh, you know, in the drought, for example, that, that we had last year, the survival rate, the growth, and they got into flower and seed in the first year. That was magnificent. So we were asked by uh, the BNRC uh, whether we could actually put out some more because research showed is good. So we put out uh, a number of them to this site, which kind of maybe helped a little bit with fire too, because some of the plants that got the color, mm -hmm. they got a little damage, but they didn't die. So anyways, so what, what we can see here that Without color and with color, what is uh, the production of uh, flint sage? How, how big it grew at the diameter of the plant, and that was a significant like, different different result. So this one came about as an opportunistic planting opportunity. Um, this so this road to kind of orient you guys, if you can see this. So this is the north road entering into the Anselmo mine yard. If you're familiar there. Um, and so one of the things that we identified quite a few times is this existing erosion problem there. Um, and so Brandon, Eric, and the crews went out and they actually created this swale there. Um, and there's actually, I know this tree looks dead, but she's not dead, I swear, she's alive. So we kind of wanted to preserve that and, and also kind of trap some of that water there. Um, so then it was this newly constructed area. So Brandon came to us and was like, this would be a great opportunity. Um, so this is a, a good example of installing plants where we were already doing remedy work um, and kind of, you know, saving costs here and there. So uh, we did install 120 plants there. And see the seed in yes. with the native mix, which yep. I checked today. They're coming out nicely. Mm -hmm. Like they're little, but they're uh, coming out. They're all natives, native mm -hmm. grass, grasses. Uh, the final site that we worked on last year is Scrap H. And so if you recall, we actually worked on that um, last in 2018 and installed 1300 plants. Um, and at this site, we actually employed the rough and loose technique. And I'm going to let Robert talk about some of the survival data that they've seen. Yeah, so in the rough and loose technique or some old and um, micro topographic um, treatment uh, on the on the riparian areas. So um, what they do, they kind of use uh, a bucket and take uh, of a soil surface uh, soil out, and then they place one uh, the bucket kind of side uh, halfway to uh, the side, and then they they take another one out. They they lay it over, and that way they just receive these mounds and uh, holes in the area, and that provides an additional microclimate. Even on a south facing slope, we can gain a north facing and east or west. And in those mounds, there is actually a good opportunity for the rainwater or snow to accumulate and that way uh, their survival rate of the plants could be much better. And so what you guys see on these uh, on these figures is just simply providing the survival rate uh, within the rough and loose treatment. And in the same site, we can see that uh, lower here, there's just a. Oh, so I see it better the, that's just a, a native mix. And here is where we apply this uh, rough and loose. And we're so this graph is showing the survival rate uh, of the plants that we put in here. So trees and shrubs and forbs. And then uh, 
the survival rate outside of it when we put the plants into a competitive environment into the grasses. And you can see that we had, I don't know, 20, 25% worse of a survival rate compared to the rough and loose. So that technique in a way just itself, like just right next to one another kind of uh, can provide us something that we can learn it. And if we could employ that at more areas, that would be beneficial. It's not pretty. So we didn't get actually a lot of, uh, you know, uh, what is it like when you tell people? Yeah. Oh, exactly. yeah. oh yeah, competition. Yeah. This looks great because they are weird because they have bare surfaces and there's sometimes a little bit of weeds um, on those bare surfaces. I think what we should actually help it with, like seed it in very quickly with a native mix and then uh, that could be uh, helped quickly. But anyways, just for the plans that we put in, rough and loose work much better. On your graphs, what's the difference between the blue and the copper? Oh, it's just uh, when we put them in and then the year of the monitoring. Okay. Sorry, we should have. So installation numbers and then monitoring numbers. Okay. Uh, so the blues are installation and oranges are monitoring data. Sorry. Okay. So not terrible mortality. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, typically mortality rates are much higher. <laughs> um, one thing I just thought of. For folks that like Courtney, I know um, you might not be so familiar with the site. This was a site that was newly constructed as well um, by our BSB crews. And then again, we went in and did that with native planting installations there. Um, so went back in um, and installed another 1,090 plants. Um, and we planted within some of the rough and loose. There's like a really it's nice that situation for the whole. Yeah. But they turn out they turn out really nice and they provide you know some nice like kind of a nice basin for the water with them and everything um and then below that kind of what robert was talking about so this is all rough and loose and then down below here is kind of a it's a really young cat so really young native seedlings and grasses so there's lots of pockets that we can go in and plant in and so we did we went back in with that May I interject yeah. one thing yeah. right there, just just mostly for the new members of our council is, you know, one of our goals for the for the um, for our plan was to do restoration and remediation together. Mm -hmm. And, this, and is. this this is like the perfect example mm -hmm. of them coming under remediation and, you know, disturbing the sites basically and then coming in under the restoration yep. and doing some of the planting. Exactly. And so I just want to make that point for for some of the newer folks. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, so on to That's our 2022 planting plans. We don't want to install 6,000 plants again, Robert. <laughs> Just kidding. Robert gets crazy sometimes. Crystal and I have to really reel him back in. He's, we're, he works us to the death. <laughs> so we, we, uh, we are proposing two sites, Robert. <laughs> so we are proposing uh, to continue working east along that slope. Um, we have kind of one more area that we want to fill in on the slope. Um, kind of a side note, we have had our breeze evaluators out and she gave me a quick message today and she was like, you know, the native plants are really doing well and they're really helping that south facing slope. So that was kind of a, you know, great thing to hear because Sometimes it gets really hot planting on it. So, mm -hmm. so we're proposing a thousand plants there. And then we're also proposing to work on the Buffalo South. Um, and we'll orient you guys to that site in a minute here. So, and we're hoping at the Buffalo South, we're thinking about 2000 to 2500 plants. Just kind of depends on what, what rolls out where we stock Robert. So all total 3000 to 3500 plants. Again, all of those plants will be grown and sourced by the Montana Tech Native Plant Program. And all of the sites will be prepared by our crews with the operations and maintenance occurring prior to. Actually, our crews have already been out on both sites um, doing work for us. So, and, and you know, but what Abby is also saying, sometimes, you know, when there was a year when we proposed 6,000, that was maybe our most. And we were really sweating blood because some of our sites had a cap like this deep, and then we needed to drill either lower down or find some other solution. So, you know, we try to kind of come up sometimes with big numbers, but that, for example, is right away um, a condition that makes us think twice. Maybe we say a couple of less or a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand less plants, but if actually drilling goes like butter, 
we could probably go up with numbers. That that is. But it never works. You always have arguments about Robert. Who else? Lesson learned by Crystal and Abby many times, and I'm putting my foot down. I also almost broke my. I have a lot to do. Injuries, yes. So again, I'll just kind of quickly go through the minor itself because we did actually we just went through this right. We just talked about this one. Um, so again, all of our corrective measures have been implemented. Um, Brandon and the crews and the weed, con weed department have been out performing weed control already. Um, and we've actually instructed them to continue that all season up until the point of us planting in the fall. Um, and then probably after that, there might be a little more additional. And then we'll, again, after installing the plants here, we will interstitially seed post October 15th. Which we might be planting past that anyway. There's a lot of knapweed out there. You can see yeah. it up on that picture. Those the green things. These guys. Almost all knapweed, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The fire did help us some of that last year, but we just getting right back on top of it. Um, so again, we are proposing a thousand plants here. Um, we are proposing on this east end to utilize um, more of the weeded and unvegetated pockets that we create. Um, we will augment with soil if necessary. Uh, I already talked about the seeding and then, um, you know, the main thing that we found on these south facing slopes, right, is we just want to increase that woody species so that we can increase the soil, soil stability and minimize our erosion. Okay, south facing slopes, as you guys know, are the hardest ones I feel like to plant on. Um, the Buffalo South uh, was last evaluated in 2021. Um, some of the things that the evaluators found were serious weed infestation. Uh, active erosion, and then there were a few barren areas as well. Um, so since that time, we have implemented weed control. Again, the crews have been out since May implementing weed control, and again, we'll continue right up until we start planting. Um, I say I say that because uh, at different times, it's better to combat the weeds. So depending on when they're seeding. So um, the other thing that we want to do is or the other thing that we did, I'm sorry, is on the east end of the site, and when I show you the map, actually, we don't go to it. On this end of the site, um, we had a lot of stormwater runoff from the street here. So we actually expanded this entire area to um, help control the velocity and then also um, correct the active erosion that was occurring there. It was really hard to keep the plants there just because of how much water was coming off. And we will, of course, seed when we're completed. There is a very good potential uh, for native plants to thrive here mm -hmm. because uh, although the breeze yeah. evaluation reported a lot of barren areas, they seem to be uh, really just decomposed granite that is not really, was probably not suitable for the reclamation mix for like crested wheatgrass. Mm -hmm. But what we see, what also you see, those uh, um, green, not greenish, uh, silverish color. They're, those are again just sages, and that shows us almost the the plants or the species that we should work <laughs> with and kind of try to fill in those interstitial uh, environments uh, among the grasses. So, of course, weeds, but but we also need to consider that this site has very good potential. I like that much better than the Anselmo for Right. Uh, plant things for sure. <laughs> yeah. We, because of its story, history. I agree. So anywhere you see like a bare space in this bottom picture, that's a place we can put a plant. Um, and we were really excited kind of looking at the site because of the decomposed granite, because the other site that we saw such a high amount of decomposed granite on, well, two sites I would say that performed really well is Clark Mill Tailings. Yeah. Call me crazy. I know there's not a lot of cover there, but the trees are growing so well. And then the other one would be the Travona which we are never planting on again because of the rocks, but really, <laughs> Crystal and I might retire. I no, but that site thrives and it's because it is in the native soils there and that decomposed granite and we're coupling it with the right species. So we are really excited about this site and the opportunities that it has. Um, Clark meal really, which it was a zinc meal and we know it's hot from some perspectives, so we directly plant it into the, um, what should we call it, into the contaminated media. Um, and some were really hot and they didn't grow anything, but we have the biggest uh, pines, for example, yeah. already that, that after we kind of set, put them in as seedlings like this, there, some of them are really coming up uh, nice and they just find a nice mm -hmm. environment. 
of course, human health concerns. I don't know how about <laughs> much that, but but we proved that we can directly put stuff into the contaminated media. So for this site, um, this is the site actually we are proposing to hold the community planting. Um, this is a large site, so this is just to kind of orient you guys better. This is Buffalo Street here, so and here's Main Street. Um, so a huge site. We could plant on this for a couple of years, honestly, and still not fill it. Um, we are proposing, if I can get my clicker back, to hold the community planting in the center part of this site. Um, and the biggest reason is because the access here for the community and for the public that would be on site would be really easy. It's very gradual. Um, at times, it's almost even flat. Um, so it just would propose, or it would just provide a great area. Um, so that's where we propose the community and plan. Based, Go ahead. So based on the Mariana model, you can see a big blue patch, and then all the little micro environment that my environments that Abby pointed out, they are kind of shown with colors also to the right. Uh, so those will be the, the places where we have a good potential to put in more wet loving species mm -hmm. uh, compared to other parts of the hill. Yeah, and just to and jumping right onto that, that's where we propose to put another 1,000 to maybe 1,500, sorry, plants, um, just to enhance that recently completed stormwater structure and all the work that's been done there. Um, again, here, we're just kind of hoping to utilize those weeded and unvegetated pockets. This It looks pretty good, so we really don't want to disturb it more with scrapes. Um, so we'll augment with soil if necessary. Um, we will post interstitial seed uh, post planting. And then again, the whole goal increase the woody species diversity. And we came up with the scrapes idea. I don't know if, if that is actually clear to anyone, is that the reclamation. So our main goal is to diversify that hill because it has usually a monoculture of a couple of species, a grass or two. So we should actually increase the, the numbers of species to 12-ish uh, or more. Uh, but the, the grasses seem to be too competitive. So if we actually directly would put them into among the grasses very close to them, our experiences show that they don't, but they are not going to make it or not very successfully for sure. So the scrapes tend to actually knock back the competitive um, uh, power of these uh, plants, of these grasses, and we actually very successfully installed plants. And I was just out today with Raylin, yesterday also with Raylin and Teal who were doing the breeze evaluation and on the Anselmo, I guess it's East Slope, the scrapes that we did, they were like this wide and as long as the, this room or maybe twice as long, they're, they're thriving in the grasses. They have, I don't know, 80 to 90% of native grass cover and in among them the, uh, the plants outside where we didn't do the scrapes, it's just the patchy sheep fescue or the, the crested weed grass. So in a way that shows us a good potential if we want to improve these sites, there's good ways to do that. And uh, it takes a couple of years. In the beginning, they were weedy, but now no cheatgrass, no nothing crazy in them. So uh, I was really happy to be out there with them uh, to, to see that. And yeah. So some of the additional activities that we anticipate um, coinciding with a lot of this work and then leading up to it, um, we'll continue weeding on previously planted sites um, just to kind of help that turnover rate from a weedy site to more of a native plant. Um, we'll also apply mulch as necessary. Um, one of the things we've talked to you guys about is soil moisture monitoring. Um, a couple of years back, Robert and I developed a protocol to kind of mo uh, monitor the moisture in the soil. And that was all just to gear our watering schedule. Um, last year, it was really helpful because even in June, it got hot right away. So right off the bat, we were able to implement, you know, maybe weekly watering when the plants really needed it. So we didn't have high turnover. And then when we monitored again in August, we were able to back right back off of it. So it's kind of just kind of making for a more dynamic system. Um, we'll apply watering to as needed to older sites. Um, if you guys recall, a lot of the sites kind of as we go along, we've kind of been taking them off because we need to encourage them to be more self-sustaining. OK, that's again the goal, right? Less water. Um, we'll also continue with the frequent application of the deer the deer repellent, it appears to be working. I'm sorry for the person that applies it because it smells terrible, but it does it does work if you apply it monthly. Um, 
Robert and his crew will continue on with monitoring, um, assessing and improvement, improving current restoration approaches, and then also we'll continue with our community engagement by implementing the community planting event in the fall. And I believe the date we're looking at for that is October 8th. This Saturday, I believe we're thinking. Okay. With that, um, I'll jump right into our budget. So Butte Silver Bow is presenting a budget, um, a total budget for $99,282. Um, this kind of gets hard to see at the bottom. I apologize. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so of this, we um, we are requesting 71,173 from BNRC and Butte Silver Bow is providing a match of $28,109. Um, and so of this, I'm just going to break it down into the four, four, four categories that you see here. So they consist of personnel, contract services, marketing and communications, and the supplies and materials. Um, so just to start up at personnel, um, if you notice, um, this is all of the numbers there, those are the numbers of hours that we anticipate putting into this program. Um, and we have gauged that off of historical numbers, kind of tracking where we have put our work the past several years. Um, so if you look there, uh, we are requesting from BNRC $41,634 uh, with the match from us of $18,548 uh, for a total of 68,182. Um, under contracted services, we are anticipating around 75 hours of weed control. This is historically where it's kind of held. Um, and so then at $65, we would be providing a match of 4,875. Under marketing and communications, um, this would be poster printing. This would be advertising for the event. Um, this would be all geared towards the community planting. Um, last year, I know we kind of kept that placeholder in there, kind of hoping for it to happen, and it never did. Um, but this year, we're pretty optimistic that it's going to happen. Um, under supplies and materials, you'll notice again under that vegetation, right? There is no item there anymore because all of the plants are procured through Montana Tech. Um, under watering, uh, you won't also see our water that we are putting on the plants as well, like from our summer labor. Um, and that is because we are using the Metro effluent on our sites. So there's no, that's a cost savings to the whole program. Um, we do have water for the landscapes of Montana. Um, and right now we have it in there um, at $3,000. Uh, the amount of fuel that we're estimating too, which hopefully doesn't go up, but the amount of fuel we're estimating is 2,400 ish we'll see i think that's blown the bank recently with our trucks um the soils that you'll see provided here these are soils that are for restoration purposes only no, nothing to do with remedy um so these are if we need to go in and you know augment something um to build up an area something like that um the mulch as well that's purely for the native plants um i have a small stockpile left but it seems like we go through it pretty quickly um, general under general supplies, um, you'll kind of see some of our watering supplies as we're getting bigger with these sites um, and installing thousands of species. Um, this would consist of things like longer hoses. Um, we might need to replace some hoses, things like that. Pretty simple. Um, there's our deer deterrent expense. Um, under equipment, we do have our excavator, um, our BSB operated excavator in there, just in case we get a wild hair and we're like, oh, just kidding. We want to do scrapes. We don't know. <laughs> Depends. Um, also drill fuel, drill kit, um, and bits. The work is pretty rough out there. And every year we consistently snap two of the drills in half, um, which happened again, Robert. So, so we do need to replace a couple of them again. Um, the other things, you know, just some safety equipment. So knee pads have been very helpful kind of blocks the blow from the drills, um, also work gloves. We also have in here work gloves for the public for the community event, as well as trowels. Um, and then we also, you'll see under equipment rental, we do have just the placeholder for that mini excavator. That's in the case that our excavator is out doing remedial work and we need, you know, we need this a piece of equipment to perform the planting installations. 
So um, again, did I miss anything, Julia? You're good. I think that's it. So on to Robert's budget. Maybe. OK, um, that's my favorite talking about the budget. <laughs> so. Um, Compared to Butte Server, our budget, I think, is a little more simple because it's mainly uh, for personal. So as you see, so we are requesting a total of $155,000 and uh, most of that is uh, for uh, personal uh, costs. We have uh, our greenhouse manager who is keep her employed because she is one of the most she's the most important uh, Part of this engine because if we would not have crystal there would be nobody really to kind of uh, do the whole operation my summer salary uh, uh it's kind of in a year it's it's two months that comes out of it and that comes with those both of those comes with uh, fringes and benefits and we actually asked for a master student and an undergraduate students uh pay for that year which is july 1st till june 30th um and uh, there is also a cost share. So my uh, summer salary partly comes from that, but I'm uh, I'm also responsible for running the program throughout the whole year, and I do that kind of voluntarily. But it is in a way uh, a cost share because uh, the research time that I can spend at tech, which is twenty five percent, just help me with that, uh, Angela or Beth. Twenty percent total. Twenty percent. So I'm using that to actually run the program to you know work with the students, work with Crystal, and just kind of do a daily um, check on or whatever that needs to be done, so that you can see at the cost share column here. And also there is a number here uh, for work study students. So there's an opportunity for students to come to us and work with us uh, as a work study. And that is also not taken off from the program. And then the other things we, which we cannot even budget all those students who work for their certificates and masters, which actually are paid from totally different budgets. And some of them are uh, even our uh, you know, volunteers or they need to work for a whole semester. Every, every week they do three, four hours at least. And many times we have so many students that Crystal cannot even uh, turn her head around. Uh, anyways, so so we have all those people working with us and really others like uh, our supplies and communications. And there's a tuition uh, fee here that we would like to ask from the BNRC for what for the master student. If we can identify that student, there's two, three students coming into the system and um, I'm hoping that one of them will be taking on work with us and even writing his or her thesis out of this uh, work. So that is our ask here. And I don't know if you have questions. I'm happy that I have Angela and Beth also here. <laughs> uh, they can answer questions that are tricky. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, with, so I, 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 I guess with that we are both open to questions. Questions from the council first on the program. Well, well I, I don't have any. Did you turn the lights on? Yeah. I'm trying to. I don't know if I did. Oh, you do it. There you go, Ben. Uh, Good work. I, I don't. I don't have any questions about the budget. If you wanted to start there, or if anybody had questions on budget, but I, I wanted to talk or ask a little bit more about uh, what what the cumulative effects of of your work are starting to show. You know, um, we've been at it a while. Uh, we knew it was a long term job. And I guess what I'm asking is, are we are we getting to the point where we're implementing the program based on our lessons learned? or as a matter of practice now, or are we still finding we, we, we have a lot to learn yeah. yet? Uh, and each year you do it, do you get more confident in how you're doing it, or do you get you know, thinking that you still got so much to figure and out? And the other way around too, there are sides. So so starting, I, I feel optimistic, so just, 
from today, sites that we established in 2016. Uh, that was I came in the program uh, in 2015 when we just monitored the previous uh, years. And that site at the Anselmo East that was established then. And what I see there is very positive, good survival of natives. And then the different techniques that we try out, they work. And, you know, it's hard to say uh, how big of an impact one of, you know, some of some of these um, uh, works have on the whole entire site because we usually focus on smaller sections and you know we would like those to actually spread out to the sites and be better but also in the same time we'd like to actually develop techniques that could be actually employed on a larger scale and of course working with Bucerebo and if the sites get evaluated and the sites fail we now know better what to do a, a good example would be the uh, Alice South Slope that was a comp like it failed three times uh, two. Yeah, that's how, that's just how it yeah, failed fail two times and uh, it was a complete I'm on redo. That's the biggest deal I saw on the hill and we worked together with Butzer Um and we decided that it is so bad that we should just till or disc the whole thing and seed it in and it was a, a decision made together with them, uh, you know, starting from what to do, how deep, when is this, what is the seed mix we're going to apply there. And I think that is just right, right there, a great, a great uh, showcase of the program that what we can do if it comes to the uh, situation where we need to do a bigger adventure. And to the level where what is the mission or program, diversify the sites to a number of species. I think that is going well. So since we have been here and since 2016, we are actively put in a lot of plants and there is, I wouldn't say it's 100% survival rate, but even if it's not, depending which sites, we are approaching those numbers as for numbers of species and some really spreading better than others. We're learning which plants to use for the future. Again, future studies with students. Anyways, I feel optimistic and Trevona, beautiful. We could we could just walk down there and um, you know we should actually do uh, a BNRC board member uh, trip to some sites that are performing on our in our opinion really good. And you know here's the technique that we employed here. Look at the differences. I think that would be a really good idea. Uh, and then the other thing I, I'm remembering Pat uh, pointed it out. We also had a small project, and I need to say that to the board. Uh, the, we had a greenhouse project, so a, a whole greenhouse was built at Montana Tech with the help of the BNRC, but of course later on with the help of Montana Tech's budget as well. So it's ready and it's running, and we should actually plan a trip to visit the new greenhouse, uh, which is NRDB funded, small project funded greenhouse, so we should get that too. Anyways, just kind of advertisement. So I don't know if I, I answered well, to your, well, I, I was just your about question. trying to get at this notion of whether or not uh, it's my understanding anyway that in the next couple of years we're going to do some significant reclamation, you know, remedial improvements on the hill. Mm -hmm. We're going to do unreclaimed areas. We're going to do yeah. those that were insufficiently reclaimed in the past. And, and I guess I'm trying to get a feel for how ready we are to implement these restoration practices to, you know, coming up uh, in, in the big picture, you know, uh, that we got a good good plan of attack now but based on the lessons learned in the last yeah. five years and there's no two same sites so it mm -hmm. always takes you know it, the 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 alleys was terrible but it takes uh also into consideration how well can we collaborate how brave are we are we ready to maybe do bigger um interventions to a site if needed and you know not try to just take care of some of the weeds but go into them i think we have uh, answers to both directions. I don't say that all our sites look beautiful and I would be showcasing them all over the place because they're just so different. There's no two uh, same restoration site. Of some, I'm proud. Of some, I'm not that proud or we are not that proud, I would say. But they're still young. I think that's the other thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Plants are such an exponentially longer process, right? Especially with the plants that we're installing, like the little 10 and 40 babies. I mean, so I do think, I guess, two things that kind of came to mind. I do think it would be helpful if the BNRC, if we brought you guys out to see them, because, you know, you guys are kind of the mouthpieces for some of this work. And for you to see them and say, you know, if somebody stops you and they're like, oh, that looks terrible. I know they just planted. I saw them last year. 
but you stop and say, no, actually, there's all of these natives here. This is very diverse. This is performing very well. So that's a huge, you know, that's a big piece there. The other thing, too, I think, John, though, is that, you know, and I know you guys hate this, but we're scientists. And so, you know, you're always learning. Um, there's always lessons to be learned. So I think the biggest thing is, yes, we are making great strides, definitely. But the other thing I would couple with that kind of goes into what John and Robert had talked about is we are entering this, you know, dry climate, which is really funny because actually as long as I've been with Montana Tech for 20 years now, um, we've always characterized Butte as a semi-arid desert. So we're like finally getting there. Um, so we kind of got to keep moving the plants that way, right? So we are going to be learning some lessons on sustainability still. I mean, I just, just keep employing methods. Julia. So one of the things, there are two things that I think are important. I would say with confidence that what we have learned, particularly at Scrap H with the integration of yeah. the mm -hmm. remedy and restoration, that that is a strategy that has informed how Beat Silver Bow has engaged with our partners in Atlantic Ridgefield mm -hmm. to discuss the success and the full outcome of performing those two projects concurrently. And I think also the continued scientific aspect of this program, you know, one of Robert's findings, which we talk a lot about decomposed granite, is the, the survival rates are much higher when we are using native soils to this area, mm -hmm. as opposed to those that are Im imported. brought in or imported from maybe a, a riparian area. And I think that that's also an important data point for us because, you know, we're looking at doing large scale re remediation in this community across you know, 180 acres. How can we use what we have found to make sure that as we are uh, making decisions about remedy that we're not just using deer lodge soil or Bozeman soil, but we are trying to integrate the decomposed granite in our process so we have positive survival rates, yep. which then becomes sustainable because we have native plants that are that want to be in decomposed granite. And there are challenges there because from a regulatory perspective, decomposed granite is going to be very <laughs> different uh, composition from a laboratory's perspective than what EPA quote approves of. And so yeah. those are some challenges that maybe, I think that that's really the benefit of this work from strategic perspective. It's harder to reach a 60% cover or decomposed granite in general. Uh, but I would say those are all things, if we take into consideration the, the cryptogamic crust, you know, the mosses and the lichens and everything together, we will reach that. But we need to consider it more of a, as a native system, not a cap that's supposed to have 60% of crested wheatgrass and forever. That is that is a bad goal, probably. And can I just, Go. maybe it's too late, yeah. but there is a story from the Clark area where we were out there and we planted, I don't know, Crystal, how many plants? Three, 4,000 in the Clark Mill? Mm -hmm. So one runner, an elderly gentleman, came up to us and, what are you guys doing here? I saw a couple of years ago these students and they they put in just thousands of plants and see nothing and i just said come over and then we kind of just went through and and you know showed him all the little babies that are spreading all the way they're not christmas trees and they're not aspen as tall as their ceiling ceiling but they're plants that's supposed to be there in that area and i could show him so there's probably not the same number so maybe not six thousand but i can i'm assuring you that there's three thousand or more now of certain species because of how they're spreading and it's because people are not paying enough attention probably sometimes to this and that gentleman's work completely changed because he expected we put in trees and next year there should be big trees there <laughs> so that's the perspective sorry it is perspective <laughs> questions i'm jump in just right, a on second on, yeah. for, from what you said i, I want to make an analogy to something that i think everybody that grew up in butte probably will seize a bench. So um, I'm probably uh, dating myself, but when I, when I was a kid here, the big M was, there was not a tree on it. Yeah. And now look at it, but it took time mm -hmm. to get there. So I think that's what we're seeing here is it doesn't happen, you know, in one, two years, it happens more over a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So throw that in there. The first um, restoration project that was started in the 1950s and they're monitoring it yearly. It's a long respiratory project, and they're monitoring still today the person who actually started already died, and they're they still didn't reach the natural 
condition where it's supposed to be just kind of <laughs> it takes that long many times and it's just a period a long rest period and then I just had a, a couple of just quick questions and then we'll, we'll go to Courtney. Um, so after you do the native planting, do you see like less weed? I mean, does do they outcompete the weeds better than than like the, the crested grass and some of that stuff? I, I do you see any depending on the site? I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. Yeah. At the site that I talked to you today with the scrape, totally. Yeah. And Selmo, no. Yeah. Yeah. But but I think the thing too is that you know we do we try to only do a year or two of hand holding, right? So watering, weeding, things like that. Right. Um, so it seems like some of the sites where we've been successful at like hand pulling or spot spraying or mowing still, when we go back in like four years, like I'm thinking of the Lexington South Slope, that thing was hideous the first couple of years. I was like, why did we do this? Mm -hmm. But now it looks so different. And it's because of some of that. For lack of better terms, hand holding and intense weeding that you know Crystal and our crews have done, so it just takes a little time, and it just it definitely depends on the site. But like the Lex is a good example of it; it totally just turned around, mm -hmm. and it is starting to do better with the weeds. Um, it just might take a little bit more. Okay. okay. And if we can keep with the interstitial seeding things like that, just to kind of get to out competing those weeds. I mean, because weeds are always going to be a component in that system, yeah. right? But they need to be the minimal component. Yeah. And and so we're talking about the um, decomposed granite. Do you do you add that? How do you how do you? And I, I know we're using less soil um, yeah. than we used to, but I mean, what what is your thought on where we're going with that? I, yeah, just right now, if we find it, it's like the lottery. <laughs> Although I don't know, once we start drilling, that could be another thing because, like, yeah. the Travona is that decomposed granite, but drilling that thing was a nightmare. Yeah. Um. So we'll see. There's benefits. On there are benefits. Yeah. I think. I think that is something that you know probably needs. I think that soil composition is something that is not researched enough, and I think that's something that you know maybe with um. I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. The research that um, Robin Bullock is now the director for. Yeah, the Sarah. Maybe that's, you know, an idea for them. Just like that. Something they yeah. Definitely. Okay. okay. Sorry, I'm done. Go ahead. Oh, Bill. Um, I got a couple comments I'd like to make. Um, I'm particularly uh, pleased with the way that you've been able to progress with what you're doing. You know, I'm given that these sites have all these different makeups. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And I did not expect when you started doing this that we would be seeing these kinds of results this quickly. Okay. With that said, I think that, and you guys probably realize this, but with that being said, it takes a long time, decades, to build soils and those kinds of environments where native plants can grow and thrive. It's one thing to get them to grow for a while. It's another thing so that the soil itself and all the association, all the mycorrhizal associations and everything else get established, not just between the grasses and the forbs, but in places where there are trees so that we have this network underneath the soil that's su supporting that kind of life. And, and, and without the, you know, without taking the time, and I'm talking decades here, and I've watched what's happened not only in the Butte area, but in the Anaconda area from the smelter over the last 50 years. And if you take a look to see where we started and where we're at right now, I think you begin to realize that it's, you know, patience is a virtue here. But I really do believe that what you guys have accomplished is, is, is pretty incredible to this point in time that, you know, I am, I am somewhat surprised that in the last, what, seven years, six, seven years that we've gotten to this point. So it's, I, I think you should be commended for the work that you've done. And I think that our, the money that we have, uh, that BNRC has, has put into this has been, has been very well spent, so. Thank you, Bill. Any other questions? Go ahead, Courtney. I wanted Bill to say that. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> How's the greenhouse working? With the new the new greenhouse, mm -hmm. we are we are establishing a irrigation system now, 
And it, I don't know if you know, it's kind of a system where uh, we are pulling air through the greenhouse and it's circulating down under and it actually cools during the um, summer and it heats because of the geothermal effect uh, mm -hmm. down under during the, the winter. We have we just started to kind of bring it up to where it actually can be uh, put into operation. So we didn't grow plants yet in it, Correct. but it's op like it's it's running, it's functioning, every function. So the tables were installed this uh, spring. So we will be putting probably dry seeding, uh, which is kind of plants like rabbit brush and sagebrush that we can quickly grow from seeds in the summer. So those will be the ones that we try. But the reason we have that greenhouse is because it can have different kinds of conditions than the greenhouse up uh, in the main area that is very humid and it actually gives home to a lot of not just diseases. Diseases could be just one thing, but there's a um, couple of insects. One of them is fungus, fungus net, uh, not flies, that if the humidity is just too bad, they come onto your plants and they chew their larvae just two or two around your your little babies. And so that new greenhouse is supposed to have a little drier and cooler conditions compared to the, the one up there. But it's it's functioning. Is this the by the house that's yeah down to the south end of the canvas. Yeah. So it used to be where I took my kids for babysitting. Yeah, so I mean those houses still exist, so yeah. you could actually bring the babies down. There. <laughs> No, I just had to say, had to say that, um, you know, Paul Conrad a long time ago yep. proposed an underground uh, mine for the winter times. Uh, so is, is the greenhouse working? Do you think it's going to work well in the winter then? Yeah, I mean, it is working well. And I was part of Paul's. I helped Paul. Um, and with that, we found, I just can't, kind of am saying my take on the underground greenhouse that we need it also, even if it kind of has um, what it's like 12 Celsius during the winter down there or 13, something like that. It wasn't really enough for the plants, so we needed so it for it to be actually a successfully running operation. We would have needed to pull heat from one of those engine houses. That was the idea to kind of do that, but that that after it got flooded, so it it, it got stopped. So I think it's a great idea to do it down there, but greenhouses, especially with the new energy efficient greenhouse, I would say yes. And we have been growing plants now for many years and we're starting our seedings and everything in January. And they, you know, we can heat them up nicely and that's the time when we usually start our operations. But I would say yes. So is the greenhouse the size of it enough yeah. to produce enough stuff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can produce 10,000 uh, plants to like with the two greenhouses together in a season. And then a, a comment, uh, just the Turbonia is, I think it's the only site that produces H2S. Is it really? Yeah, I think everything else is sulfate. But the turbonia is reducing conditions to make the H2S. I don't know if that influences that site and the plant growth that you're struggling with or not. I don't know. And see, those are lessons learned, right? By, with all the components that are still. I did not. I feel either. like I'm the weed on, on this council because I'm the only no, you, engineer. You, you know, metal or not. <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh, you're, I'm sorry. You're hey, right. hey, hey. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm the only right. process yeah. type engineer. Yeah. The guys yeah, who polluted this place. Oh, nope. just kidding. <laughs> I mean, all right. So my, my understanding of that side is that why the big difference is what why the big difference is is because it came from a native, like it was the highway over burden. Yeah. Uh, from like the local me media, but who knows? Because sometimes like basic chemistry really plays a big role. I I have no idea about that. Thank you so much. We can we can see. I don't know how much. I think those are like that that work that gets, for I have me. no clue. Yeah. I think I you got a surf on your hand there for some more undergraduate projects. 
right, um, the buffalo. Uh, there the mines underneath. Uh, Brandon, do you know how many shafts there may be at the buffalo? Five shafts. Yes. Yeah. I believe there's one or two. There. Uh, on the north, I, don't, I don't have it on, on here. the north side of Buffalo Street, the, the four sides, the Kennedy and Spence. The yeah, Buffalo this Buffalo, the guy above there's, it. There's 12 on, on the north side of Buffalo Street. I believe there's one or two mine shafts on the Buffalo South. And we don't we don't see any subsidence issues on that south. We, yeah. we do have some subsidence issues on the sites on the north side of the building. But this one, through the past couple of evaluations, we've only seen a couple subsidences, and yeah. they're very small. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the past five, six years, we've seen at least a few in the city. Um, Peter Lucon had one in his backyard. Just, this is just, you yeah. know, we, be cognizant. Oh, yeah. yeah. With with the breeze sites, when we work on them, um, Brandon is, like, super busy starting in, like, April with subsidence issues. So... We're very attuned to any of those land slumps or things like that that occur. And then uh, my, my last, it's a question and a comment. Uh, these collars that you use, mm -hmm. is that right? Okay, how big were they? Are these like coffee mugs? Uh, was it 30 it's centimeter di plan. diameter? 30 centimeter. So no, they were, they were like this laptop kind of around. So it's a big coffee mug. Yeah, a huge one. You wouldn't be able to drink it. <laughs> All right, so my yeah. question, yeah. like my question on that is, is it biodegradable? Do you leave it in place? So theoretically it is, but just today I talked to Crystal at the Anselmo. I would like them to pick them up because they lost their function after the first year. So we have the plants surviving, they're growing nice. And now they're, because they are very visible to the public eye. So they kind of just a little bit trashy looking on the side. So we'd <laughs> like to kind of take them out. But it's it's cardboard, so it is. If we would stay out, it could biodegrade. Um, we take the plastic off. You know, it was Amazon package, and we take everything off. That is probably non biodegradable. But okay. it's a good question. And does it provide nutrient? Not the color itself. It just provides shade, and therefore, you know, it kind of let the moisture last longer. But we usually put in either a seed mix or some kind of a fertilizer within that island. So therefore, the plant got a little bit more competitive power um, in within this environment. Uh, we put it in the grasses, for example. Yeah. Some days I want the coffee that that thing would go around. <laughs> Smaller plants. <laughs> All right. Thanks. John, did you have something? Yeah, um, preamble is I really dig everything you guys do, and I've always been a fan of this project, and I always will be. Um, the question comes, I had my lunch today because it was a bad day, and I had my lunch today in the center of the yard at Stewart. And at Stewart, we've got a 17-acre site, well-forested. We've got an active biome in there. We have active things happening as far as building up soil and thinking about the future and re -veg on the hill. We did that entire project for less than the budget you're asking for for just for next year. And it's, you know, if you think about visibly or impactfully what our, our, our group has been able to do, you know, when, I, when someone asks me, hey, what the heck are you doing with all this money? And how do I answer the question? I've got a 17 acre active forest over here for $100,000, and I've got a 35%, you know, small plants and, and shrubs lossage per year at the Anselmo. How do I give them an answer that's that's engrossed to what we're trying to do in regards to the next hundred years of, of life on the future? Do you want to take it first? All right. I'm going to defer to Julia. I, or I can so take it. I I think our response would be I think that they are characteristically different mm -hmm. approaches um, and processes. Um, I think everyone agrees that the aesthetic improvement at the steward is something that's very dramatic. Um, and we know the public's taste for natives can be a little antagonistic because they don't, may not see beauty there. Um, I think some of the challenges or things that we would we should maybe wait to make the dis, uh, final call on this has to do with the long-term watering costs that have been associated with the steward um, versus our program where we are 
taking water away from our crop, our plantings incrementally. Um, and I, I, when I say our, I mean both Montana Tech and Arsenal. Um, what I think is going to occur in the next year, as you saw in our budget, we plan three thousand dollars to help with the watering bill at the steward plantings. Um, we did five thousand dollars last year and have been spending five thousand dollars for a number of years. Um, what I think that this is, is it's an opportunity to decrease the amount of water volume that's going to be used at the steward this, this particular summer and see how these aspens start to acclimate to less moisture. And then I think once we see the impacts of less moisture and the effect of the steward, we can make a call on its long term sustainability. And so while I think that there are heavy costs associated with maybe our programs being expensive, there's a lot of labor associated with what we're doing, and that's probably the bulk of where this price comes from. But what I do think on to the benefit of our programs is that we are seeing that they're moving towards sustainability now because we are not watering anything we planted prior to two years ago. And those are just sort of out there promulgating themselves and propagating themselves rather than having labor associated with that. And so I don't want to be critical of the steward. I think they're just, I think, categorically different projects. And I think the long term observation is understanding if we can move the successes of the steward into a very, very sustainable conservation site and emulate that outcome. Yeah. So I guess then the question would be perhaps an ask path would be next year, year after to somehow get a quantitative analysis from you guys of. Independently, understanding their different sites and they do things different about how they're actually doing, so that we can, to John's point a little while ago, we can make better choices in the next 12 years of what we're doing with our rebench fund because we're still going to be here 12 years from now. Um, uh, but what we can do with the rebench money and have active data to support that about where it can best be spent. Sure. Um, it's just an ask that that's something sure. to make happen. Thank you. And then the other thing I, I just also say is that I completely agree with you what Julia said. Completely, I would say different approaches. Uh, we try to really consider the ecology. We try to actually work with locally collected native plants. If we grow, you know, we always have ready 10,000 plants. And if we kind of just cal calculate big, it's like $15 per plant that comes out if we would just get. I, I don't think that's too bad, but. Um, oh, no, I think you guys are totally cost effective. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying. When I get asked, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, that's one of the things we are producing thousands of little native babies that are supposed to be resilient to climate change and all those things. And you know, if we put them in, they don't really die because they dry out. It's mostly because the calf has, in a way, enemies in the form of the uh, reclamation grasses. That's kind of our big deal, and no one really took care of them. Like he swiped the site out to nothing in a way, and got new soil in and put the aspen in and has kind of a, a new start to them. And it, you know, I would say it's a lot of labor, but um, again, that also shows that we try to do something with the sites, enhance the diversity. So th therefore, again, the approach is different. Enhance the diversity. He created a new, hopefully long-term, you know, uh, functioning ecosystem. And, um, and I mean, both have places and uh, the beauty environment, I would say. And but I, but I'm, I'm not undermining no. his or in a way, I don't want to say anything bad about ours. No, of course. Well, and I guess with ours, like if you're thinking of where we've, where we've gone and where we're going, right, and where we've planted, right? So if you think about the Butte Hill, it very much looks like, you know, sort of like a patchwork, right, where we've kind of planted and things like that. But the hope, and we are seeing it, Crystal's really good at noting these, um, we are seeing like those volunteers coming in. And so, you know, the goal at the end of the day is that we have this self-sustaining ecosystem across the Butte Hill, right? That, you know, if we have the less touch we have in that system, the less we have to do in the future, right? So, which is the goal of restoration, right? So, you know, we are working really hard towards trying to be more hands off. You know, we might be, and that is restoration to a T, right? You are hands on in the beginning. It might be a little more money in the beginning, but in the long term, it's self sustaining and on its own. So we really are gearing towards that goal of restoration at the core principle of it. All right. Yeah, Elizabeth will be your top warning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but think 
but it's great stuff. <laughs> that's what. That's what. And any any questions from the audience? Go ahead. Yeah. So I think it's amazing what you have been doing, and I I haven't been hearing about it for like a couple of years, but I was up in Walkerville. Yeah, I know you mentioned the South love of the hour. I was up in Walkerville and like I haven't lived here that long, but I hadn't seen it looking so blue. Mm -hmm. It is really blue. Is that yeah. blue something the, that this project has provided? Yeah, the blue that, are the native plants. That's right? what, yeah, that's yeah, they are what the I native, was thinking. Native I mean, grasses and the stage and everything, and that's that it, what I'm talking. It, you can see that color. You can see that. I mean, yep. It is just amazing. And if you haven't got it, just to look up at the alloch, yep. I, I would suggest you do that. Yes, and, and that's kind of another. Once you left, it just took care of that itself. Or you went up there in spring doing no. anything, painting no. or something. No. Once they did the big spring all of it, that's yeah. we've just it's appeared, yeah. It's, it's blue flags. Blue flags, which we oh yeah, the blue flags is yeah, 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 and that was in the seed mix, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's just lovely. I mean, it's it's totally lovely. Oh, did you take pictures? Oh, I don't think I did. <laughs> no, that's okay. I will go out tomorrow. Yeah, I had just a little snarky, lighthearted comment, but. My husband and I adopted the, you know, the two type B. We pick up between Maine and Montana on Buffalo Street. Uh -huh. And I do it twice a week. And I don't know what the price of aluminum is right now, <laughs> but I pick up two Safeway bags of Coors Light and Twisted Tea. Yeah. <laughs> you can probably we, we have some, fund half we, your project with by Safeway bags. We do have a problem with some of the parking there. Excuse me, a lot of them yeah. are going to pull out on Buffalo Street. Yeah. And if I London's agree. have a resale value, <laughs> be and you want to know what's too. also sad on top of that is how many times our crews go out in between you and Larry, yeah. and they are also cleaning those Every sites. Day. And the next week, months. you wouldn't even know they were there. And I mean, it's hundreds of pounds of garbage removed. It's crazy. Yeah. It's really sad. I just put it in the little <laughs> dumpster down there on the trail. Yeah. I throw I stick it in people's garbage cans. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's bad. We still have a littering problem. And it's mm. Coors Light and Twisted Tea. <laughs> Without faith. Uh, on my road, it's Bud Light. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if they drink in different okay. places. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, any, anything else? Questions, comments? I think you're well, in, that, in that light, uh, I, I just make a motion. Before we make a motion, we usually we just have NRDP do their review of, of the budgets. But if you want to do that now yeah, and then sure. we'll... in a nutshell, um, you know, we have John McKee's request. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he'll be after that. that. We, we've got a couple more things we need to do. We've got to finish this up first. Um, so I worked with Robert and Maddie and Crystal and Julia and Brandon uh, to help get this plan put together. I think they're doing a wonderful job. And then what I have seen from NRD's perspective is this is in line with what the restoration plan says, and it recommend it for funding. Now, now you well, yeah, you know, <laughs> To, uh, to support the uh, the two proposals uh, at the funding levels as presented this evening, which are about Department of Reclamation and Environmental Services and uh, the Montana Tech Native Plant Program. Thank you. Do we have any questions or comments on that before we take our vote? A second. We, we got. We need questions first. Now we'll take those. <laughs> All right. Do we have a second to that? I'll second. All right, thanks both. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Suzanne was an aye. Suzanne, you don't prepare for that? No nays? I'm just not used to sitting in the front face. Well, are you in favor of the proposal? Yeah. All right, okay. passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you guys. Thank you. And now I'll go to John for, he's, he's gonna give us a little on uh, climate change. 
Well, I just wanted to mention the, the eco adapt and the climate adaptation workshop that was supposed to be here meet recently. Um, there's some really great tools, actual evaluation tools to put against projects and how you're going to fund them and why you're funding them. And I think it would be best to have um, Steve Mencat, perhaps someone from the city who's adopting this program, to come in and just give us a short on it because. It helps to it helps to clarify some of the reasons by which you might want to or might not want to fund a project. Um, and the evaluation tools that come with it, I thought were really powerful. We've adopted mm -hmm. two of them inside of our company already, um, but they just sort of take out some of the mystery and some of the some of the politics and make it a little easier to make decisions. So I thought it was wicked valuable, and um, I'd like to see at least something done here at some points that they could, everybody here could potentially think about that as a tool that we use for evaluating small projects, revenge projects, things that we have a lot of money left for. Great. John, I'll get good. with you and get his information. And sure. Get that and get something going. All right. Then we have one more duty that we that, that was actually on the very first of the agenda that we missed, and that is approval of or non-approval of the of the meeting notes from the March 31st meeting. So if uh, everybody had a chance to take a look at those. Um, and I, I threw a couple of little suggestions, but yeah, nothing, exactly. there was nothing yeah, major that I had. I'm going to go through with your markups. All right, second. So we have a second on that. All in favor? I did three notes. Are you going to abstain? <laughs> so could I also follow up on on that? You know, in reading over the minutes, and the, there were it's it appeared to me a, a few questions that were raised, asked and answered, but there were a couple of things that were raised and and uh, required some answers later. Mm -hmm. So could, could we maybe get into a cycle of of uh, maybe. Uh, in the early part of the agendas to go over the minutes from last meeting and then right then deal with uh, whatever action items and questions that arose and what the report back is. I'm, I'm you know, curious about still, uh, you know, a few of the other projects that are ongoing in Butte. You know, I, I, I think it would be great to get a, a more consistent update of those projects from the perspective of the program and staff so I, I think that's a great idea yeah john after that meeting i did reach out to pq for more information on all the questions you guys asked in that last meeting and i got zero excuse me and i got zero response well it's good to know so a person could maybe intervene in that regard it, yeah it's so important for i tell I us push it up the ladder in our department and What's going on on those projects? Yeah. And I know there's a couple that I'm involved in that. You know, I'm I'm, I'm assuming that that this project we have at the golf course, you know, it's uh, I'm just fishing for ways we can be helpful to move these projects forward. If you know the regulations, the administration is is. You know, we need help just like to maybe. Call upon us to help where things are moving and. Maybe we can help with the pinch points is what I'm sure yeah. I'm asking. Yeah, and I think um, just to kind of build on that, just standing up there and saying, you know, hey, we requested this on this date and we got no response. Right. In front of it's you know. more people that can say okay. yeah exactly yeah. um i could just put on your radar a few things um so i have been in touch with um the stratton's on their stormwater inlet markers and reached out to them and they were slowed like everything else in the world by covid and they suggested maybe we could get together one evening or two evenings here in July and get together and start putting some more of those markers down 
in Uptown Butte or other places. So I'll send you guys an email and try and just do a, a poll and see when you guys are available. It wouldn't have to be everybody. Uh, even if we just get one or two hands, it makes for light work for them. So the goal is to get those down. So hopefully we can reach out. And if you have other um, civic organizations that you think might be willing to help with that effort too, just drop me an email and let me know. And we'll try and get things set up and get that one across the finish line. Is that it? All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Second. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Thanks, you guys. No, they, the archives didn't figure it out. Okay. Yeah. I did